Good morning and welcome to the eighth meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone to turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices? Our first item of business today is to take evidence as part of our continuing focus on preventative spending. This will consist of two separate evidence sessions. In our first evidence session, we hear from Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, and Douglas Sinclair, Chair of the Accounts Commission. Members have copies of the Audit Scotland report, Community Planning, Turning Ambition into Action. I'd like to be welcome both uh, witnesses to the meeting. I understand there will not be an opening statement, and so we'll go straight to uh, questions. And um, obviously you've given evidence uh, before to the committee, Caroline. It just seems a bit strange this morning. Seems just, for some reason it seems further away than normal. Oh. That's just a feature of um, committee uh, room five. So we'll go straight on to um, aspects of your report. Uh, you said in, in your report that um, Audit Scotland found that the current pace and scale of activity is contributing to an improved focus on prevention, but is unlikely to deliver the radical change in the design and delivery of public services called for by the Christie Commission. Now, obviously, you go into you go into that in, in greater detail in your report. I'm just wondering, uh, for the record, if you can uh, tell us if that's still your view and what uh, specific measures you would like the Scottish Government to uh, take forward in order to uh, uh, change that and deliver the radical change that uh, is required. Thank you, convener. I'll kick off, and Douglas may of well course, want to add absolutely. to what I say. Yeah. Um, I think that view came from the work we've done on community planning. Um, mm -hmm. We've now audited eight partnerships across Scotland between us um, and produced two national reports on it in the last couple of years or mm. so, but also from the range of other work we've done in other areas of public policy. Um, we refer in the report you have before you today to the progress that we've seen in terms of reshaping care for older people, for example, where there's been a very clear policy commitment for a while that um, healthcare needs to uh, be radically reshaped to meet the growing elderly population here in Scotland, to help us all live at home independently for longer, and to recognise the fact that resources are constrained for the foreseeable future. Um, there's been a lot of effort put into that, um, policy shifts, uh, change funds, um, and a focus on that happening. But actually our work shows that the amount of money that's shifting is really very small at the margins, and that the change which is happening tends to be small-scale pilots without the um, shift that's needed to turn that into radical reshaping, which is needed in that area of policy for older people but also in the other priorities the government has set around early years, around reducing reoffending, around tackling inequality more generally. So lots of the building works are in place, but the change we're seeing is at the margins rather than really stepping back and saying of the four and a half billion that's spent every year on older people, how do we use that better to get the outcomes that we're looking for? And as I said, uh, how could the Scottish Government um, ensure that we actually do take this forward more uh, expeditiously? We've made a number of recommendations. Um, I'll summarise them in two groupings. The first, I think, is to make sure that the planning that's done for outcomes is done more effectively. There's a huge amount of support and consensus around the outcomes approach. They're well embedded in public policy making now, both at government level and for each of the 32 partnerships across Scotland. What we're not always seeing, though, is the planning that says, if this this is the outcome that we want to improve, what is it that the government and each of the partners at a local level will do to change that? There's a number of reasons for it that I'm sure we'll explore more with the committee this morning, but that planning I think is issue number one. Issue number two um, is getting much better at shifting resources, um, at doing something I know this committee has focused on in the past, at disinvesting, stopping to spend money um, on areas that are less effective so that we can release that and shift it into the areas that will make more of a, a difference. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, we're in a period now where demand is outstripping the growth in resources available, and it's much harder to do in that context. But I think it's all the more critical if we're going to get the benefits that are um, proposed from prevention, both in terms of the quality quality of outcomes for people, but also making sure the money that we've got can stretch to cover what's needed. The committee found, you know, um, we looked at this in terms of budgets, you know, that disinvestment was a real concern yeah. about it, and it's very difficult for organisations to, to go down that uh, uh, road. Um, we'll explore that in further detail, but Douglas, I'm just wondering if you want to... Yeah, uh, so I think comments. one additional point I'd make in our report, one of the recommendations we made was the need for the Scottish Government and COSLA jointly to develop uh, a framework in order to assess uh, how well community planning partnerships are actually improving uh, and to re report on that improvement. There's a lack of an accountability framework at, at present to assess how well community, community planning partnerships are doing and how they can learn better from each other. I think that's, one of, the, that's, the, I think that's a, one of the more important recommendations in our report to develop that framework. 
Yes, I mean, I mean, I mean, in your in your report, Caroline, you know, one of the case studies you looked at was North Ayrshire, which is the area in which I represent. It was actually a community council meeting on Monday night, and uh, uh, there's a meeting in uh, Largs on Thursday to look specifically at this. And councillors there were, were asked about it, and I have to say that there still seems to be a real lack of understanding as to how this is actually going to work on the ground and the kind of time scale in which it will be delivered and indeed how uh, community organisations are going to be able to interact uh, with that. Is that a concern that, the, that, that, that you have? I, I, I think we, we do. I think it's one of the points we identified in our report. The National Community Planning Group has um, refocused its... Um, its, uh, its position in, in terms of community planning very much a focus on reducing inequalities. But one of the things that's got in the way has been the statement of ambition, which has said that community planning partnerships should behave like proper boards. Well, they're not proper boards. If you were on a board, you can get rid of somebody. Mm -hmm. You're a proper board. They're voluntary partnerships. Um, and I think there's been some confusion within community planning partnerships about what their role is. And you've brought together a range of organisations, each with their own accountability, the council to the community, the health board to the, the, the parliament, uh, police to the chief constable and so on. So there's been a confusion about, about roles. Uh, I think there's also been a confusion about um, whether they're there about place or whether they're there for national priorities, and also confusion about where they can add most value. And I think our view is they can add most value where budgets do overlap, drugs and alcohol, where they can make better, better make that money go uh, further. And I think one of, the, one of the things we've found in our community planning audits is those community planning partnerships which invested time and effort in building a relationship of trust and building a relationship of confidence in each other are the ones that have succeeded most. Um, um, those who haven't done that, where relationships are poor, particularly between the council and the health board, haven't made the kind of progress that they should. I think there's an important lesson in there for health and social care partnerships to make the same investment in building trust and, and respect and understanding each other's roles. You take the point being, for example, the comparison between a councillor, which you'll understand, and a non-executive member of the health board, they're not one in the same thing, mm -hmm. and yet they're put together around the table with the same responsibility. I don't think that's been unpacked and discussed and... and um, and uh, address sufficiently. I think that, that is an issue. So one of the things we have said is the need for the National Community Planning Group to look again at the statement of ambition, to take away any excuse uh, f for community planning partnerships, not making the kind of progress that, that we'd like to see. I think um, just building on what Douglas has said, it's worth saying we think North Ayrshire is doing pretty well. They're one of the better community planning partnerships that, we, that we've looked at in terms of using data. They've drilled that down to six neighbourhood areas to really understand the challenges in each area. In some instances, very small groupings of 20 households to understand where the need is and what they can do. And they're starting to do good things in terms of involving local people in those discussions about what matters and how you might change them. What we're not seeing more widely in many places is that then really clear prioritisation about what people are going to do. I think the one place we saw that in the last round of audits we did was in Glasgow, where given the, the wide range of problems that Glasgow is facing, the partnership is focusing on three specific uh, priorities around um, alcohol misuse, around um, vulnerable people and around youth employment. And they've used the data to identify that those are the priorities. They've recognised that actually they're interlinked and they, they often affect each other, that alcohol abuse can make um, employment much more difficult. And the, the partnership is focusing on what people can do to shift those indicators with the um, planned expectation that that will improve outcomes for the most vulnerable people in Glasgow. And we think that sort of prioritisation and the planning that goes with it is part of the trick to unlocking prevention. Yes, I mean, I mean, one of the things you've said in your report, of course, is that there's, uh, discussions about targeting resources at the priorities and shifting them on superintendent activity are still in their early stages. I mean, we've been talking about this for years. I mean, this committee alone, since the last parliament, five years ago, has been discussing preventive spending. We got a quote um, in our budget scrutiny which says by one CCP that they were now on the precipice of the next step. I mean, it does, you know, it's, it, it, I, under, I think we all understand the challenges. We've discussed these umpteen times. Your report goes into them in great detail, and we've got um, lots of um, uh, um, information about the, the difficulties, but... How are we going to break this kind of logjam, this bottleneck? How are we going to get these things, this moving forward, so that in five, another five years, we're not still talking about, you know, um, preventative activity still being its early stages or m moderately to medium stages? I mean, we really need to pick this up if we're going to see the long-term uh, changes that we all want to see. 
I'll, I'll kick off with two things. I think, first of all, we're seeing a real shift between people talking about their budgets as abstract things, as, as sort of lists of numbers around budget headings analysed in different ways, and instead really starting to sit down and talk about what that money is spent on, the number of teachers, the number of um, youth workers, the number of buildings, the number of uh, people and assets of other sorts that, that are available, and starting to think about how those people can be used better to improve the outcomes that are um, that people are working towards. Now that I think is is much more productive, both because the money is, is not an end in itself. It is buying people and assets and all of the other things that, that we know are vital for changing outcomes. But also people tend to get a bit, bit less defensive about it. You're not talking about giving up a million pounds in a year when your budget settlement is very tight. You're talking about pooling the things that people are already doing and may, maybe shifting what people do, how they spend their time, the way they're organised. So I think there's much more potential in that to move it forward. The other thing that I think is increasingly clear to us from both of our perspectives in audit work is that the pressures locally are getting tighter and tighter. And in a sense, I think, think increasingly there will be no alternative. Now, that, that doesn't make it easier to do it or more pleasant, and there are risks associated with it. But if we look at the challenges around health and social care and, again, care for older people, it's increasingly clear that the pressure we're seeing from growing numbers of older people with um, lots of long-term conditions that need to be uh, treated and cared for and very tight budgets between health and social care mean that carry on doing what we're doing just isn't sustainable. And I think the trick is to manage that in a way which gets the most change out of it and limits the risk from it. Um, I hope it, the integration of health and social care will change in that particular example, but it does need to join up to the wider reform agenda to, to avoid opportunities, again, for getting most from what we're spending collectively. Douglas? Yeah, I agree with I agree with that. I think there's also the bit uh, um, again of focusing in those areas where collectively it's easier to make um, progress. Um, it's it, it's a bit about recognising the council will still run the schools, the health board will still run the health service, but where budgets overlap, uh, say in health improvement, economic development, or inequality, I think our experience is that those community planning partnerships that are focused in those areas have said, where is, what is our collective spend, say, in economic development? How can we make that go further? And I think there's been, I think that, that focus down into those areas where there is overlap uh, helps build that, the kind of trust and confidence I mentioned earlier and, and uh, brings about results. Um, one chief executive described community planning as the art of the deliverable, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of concept everyone would agree with, community planning. You know, you'd, it's common sense. Preventive spend is common sense, but it's a very, there are difficult things to do in practice. And as Caroline's indicated, given the budget pressures, the savings that are identified, rather than going to create a pool of money to try and, you with me, for preventive spend, is going there to balance the, the budgets. And that's, I think that's been true of even change funds, where money's been diverted to, to prop up um, budgets. I think one of the issues that would help is to try and improve scrutiny skills of councillors, for example, and health board members, so they are more challenging uh, of um, the reports they get on performance to say, well, if that's not making a difference, why are we doing it? Why are you not pulling your budget with, with other partners? I think, um, particularly in an, an era of um, coalitions, the importance of scrutiny, the demise of service committees, I think scrutiny is even more important now, scrutiny for value for money, to make sure that um, the pounds that we're currently spending are actually achieving the targets that um, the Council of Community Planning Partnership have set out. Scrutiny is not desperately well developed in community planning partnerships. Challenge is not desperately well developed. That's one of the findings that, that we made. So I think there's real scope there. I think there's also a need um, for more encouragement of good practice on the ground. Um, we talk about community planning partnerships, but we also need to remember there are lots of examples of very good partnership working between uh, officials and officers of different organisations. Uh, often with nothing to do with the community planning partnership. And I think the encouragement of that by leaders, uh, leaders of the councils, chief executives, health board, is really important uh, that they, they make a statement that their, one of their commitments is a better sharing of resources, that the community planning is about the fact that no single organisation can solve the problems of, of an individual or indeed of a community. Works Scotland, you're giving evidence uh, after uh, yourselves have said, and I quote, everyone is in favour of the idea of prevention, but few want to state a career on such an uncertain business or invest public funds in preventive measures. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's one of the, the issues that we... Yeah, we and I mean, I think one of the things that can get in the way are, 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 are targets. Um, you know, the target of 
um, A and E targets, for example, the real issue is how do you stop people getting into A and E in the first place? And that, that's the preventative work. And uh, you know, the focus. Ha I think there's a debate to be had about the balance between targets and outcomes. And if we're wanting long-term change, then the focus needs to be, you know, absolutely uh, primarily on on outcomes. Okay, uh, Gavin, you wanted to come in with a supplementary. Yeah, on that point about, I mean, uh, Mr. Sinclair, I think the idea of improving the scrutiny skills of of councillors is, is obviously a sound one, but. The way you set it up suggested that there are reports going to councillors saying, you know, this isn't working and they ought to be scrutinised more. One of the, you know, when I do speak to councillors, a lot of the reports they get from yeah. officials, the reports don't say this isn't working. The reports yeah. say, oh, this is actually working pretty yeah. well. And so on. it strikes me that there are, there are very few departments who are actually prepared to say what we have spent money on hasn't worked and isn't working. I, wasn't, I didn't actually say that, and I agree with you. I think... Um, I think a lot of officers um, have still to come to terms with the fact that it is the job of councillors. It's a key part of the job of councillors to scrutinise their performance. And it is one of the duties of officers to ensure that members have, elected members, have the necessary information in a form and in a, in a comprehensive nature in, 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 to enable them to uh, ask uh, le legitimate questions. It's not, it's not, it's not a one-way ticket, I think. You know, officers have as much a responsibility as do as do councillors, and it's true to say you know of, many officers don't like being challenged, but they they need to be challenged, uh, and and um, I think it's important that councillors have the skills and have the confidence and have the information to discharge that role properly. Okay, okay. I mean I've just got one other area to touch on before I open uh, out to committee, and that's um, you know Audit Scotland. Um, you said that. Um, CPPs need to, in a quote, understand what a successful shift to prevention would look like. So how, how should that look in, in your view? Um, I think it picks up something that you just quoted from the What Works Scotland submission mm. that you've got. And that's the challenge that for lots of these outcomes, actually, we, we don't know what works. The evidence isn't always there. Um, the, the outcomes by their nature will take a generation to achieve mm. and if there is good practice in one place it's not at all clear that it will work somewhere else if you've got different geography and demography and all of the other things that affect it so I don't think it's as simple as saying here, here's what works we just need to spread it externally I think we need to get better at really understanding what it is that we're trying to achieve in the, the local part of Scotland we're responsible for, the CPP, or for some things, a smaller area than that, a neighbourhood, um, to look at the whole range of things that might tell us what could make a difference, the evidence where it exists, good practice from elsewhere, the understanding and insights of the staff working locally and local people and voluntary sector organisations and everybody else, and then be much more systematic about planning what it is we expect to improve the outcome that we want to shift and how we, will, how we know if it's working or not and can therefore carry on doing that or disinvest again and try something else. And I think we've got some really good examples from things like the patient safety programme that the government's leading in the NHS that that sort of approach works. In that instance, I think the evidence probably is a bit better than it is for some of the other outcomes we're focusing on. But the same approach of, in a really targeted way, identifying what action you think will make a difference, monitoring it, and either investing more or pulling back, I think, is a key part of doing it. Okay, thanks, Douglas. There may be a, there may be a precedent um, and, uh, in looking at um, benchmarking in councils, where you've created families of councils, like councils of a similar, similar nature, so that the council can compare their performance with a council that's of, of say, a, a rural council with a rural council. And you could think of families of CPPs, you're with me, of similar CPPs, and the same, the same thing, if, you're able, if that CPP is able to do that, why are we not able to do it? And there's still this huge resistance in Scotland to, if it wasn't invented here, we're not going to do it. There's a, a quote I often use in the recent um, report on Welsh public services that good practice is a bad traveller. And there, there is a, there's a, sometimes an unwillingness in Scotland to learn from each other, to say, well, if, if they've done it, why reinvent the wheel? Why not just pick that, pick that good, good practice up and run with it? OK, thanks. I'm now going to open up the session. And the first colleague to ask questions will be Malcolm, to follow by Joan. I, I was going to actually refer to that last point that um, the convener made um, about needing support to help them understand what a successful shift to prevention would look like, but I, I kind of read through the whole report, which I found useful, and I was just trying to uh, trying to analyse what the nature of the problem was, and I kind of d d divided it into positive statements about progress on the prevention agenda and the more negative ones. I mean, the only positive ones I could find really were that all SOAs demonstrate a strategic commitment to the prevention agenda. 
uh, and then it also said CPPs are starting to focus more on preventative activities. So they were sort of uh, signs of hope. But on the other hand, we had discussions about targeting these resources, uh, uh, their priorities and shifting towards preventative activity are still in the early stages. We even had a statement saying uh, there are also differences of opinion about the extent to which community planning should focus uh, on prevention and inequalities and the Scottish Government didn't come out totally unscathed because it said um, the Scottish Government needs to demonstrate a more systematic approach to implementing its outcomes approach. At present, many performance management frameworks are still heavily focused on inputs and processes and lack a clear prevention focus. So I was just trying to analyse exactly you know, what the problem is. So going back to the first point that the convener has already introduced, clearly there needs to be more national support. But it, should that be the heart of what we now focus on? Or are there still problems that are prior to that in terms of the attitude of community planning uh, towards the prevention, uh, preventative agenda? I mean, it, does everybody accept it as a, uh, as a concept? Uh, and, and is it really the evidence and the support that we should focus on? Or are there still some other problems in there as well? My view is that there is very strong consensus that prevention has to be the way to go, both as a way of making the resources fit the needs, but also because it's better for the people we're all here to serve to um, solve problems before they happen, rather than spending a generation dealing with the consequences of them. Um, I think, as we say in the report, there is space to make better use of the um, uh, support for improvement for prevention that's available. At the moment, it tends to be quite um, lots of small-scale interventions, not particularly well joined up. There's a lot of resource there, but it's not all um, aligned and driving in the same direction. I do think, though, picking up the point that Douglas made earlier, that there's also something for government to, to do to step back and make sure that the outcomes it wants to achieve longer term are consistent with the um, short-term performance management arrangements which are in place, as we say in the report. Um, one example from my report on the NHS that was published before Christmas, um, we think there's increasing evidence that although the reshaping care for older people strategy is absolutely the right one for 2020 to have much more care provided at home, allowing people to um, live independently in good health, the combination in the short term of very tight financial targets and the heat targets mean that there's not very much room to really step back and think about how you can um, take resources out of some services and reinvest in the ones that would avoid admissions in the first place or help people to be discharged more quickly. Now, that's not an easy thing to do, either politically, because there's a lot of focus on those targets at the moment, or professionally, clinically, and in terms of social care. But I don't think we know, in an area like Lothian, for example, how much would you need to invest in home care, in geriatricians working in different settings, um, in rapid response to avoid admissions, in the first place for older people living at home in order to be able to reduce the huge amount that we spend on people who are in hospital for more than 28 days unnecessarily, people who have very bad outcomes because they're admitted um, when a problem could have been prevented. There's that need to pull back and really understand better what the problem is and what the possible solutions might be in preventative terms. And I think that's true for older people services, but also much more widely. So it's a kind of combination of understanding the evidence better, but obviously you have referred there to the very difficult financial constraints, so yes. presumably it's a combination of the two. Mm. Absolutely. I, I, think, I think you need to do both, but I, my, my sense is that the improvement support needs to be operating at a more strategic level to really understand the scale of the problem Scotland-wide and at local levels mm. so that we can start to make plans for the sort of reinvestment that this committee is talking about and understand what the consequences of that would be for the short term. So, so what is, what, what, why is there a sentence about there are differences of opinion about the extent to which community planning should focus on prevention? Is that, what was the evidence for that statement? It comes from the eight um, community planning partnerships that we have jointly audited over the last three years or so. Um, and I think it comes back to the point we also make that each of the partners have got different accountability arrangements. As Douglas says, the partnership itself has no um, formal status. It's not accountable to anybody. Um, the council uh, is 
responsible, accountable to its electorate. The health board is responsible to the cabinet secretary. The um, divisional police uh, officers are accountable to the chief constable and then to the SPA. And those people are being driven by their own um, performance management frameworks as well as by whatever the CPP has set um, as its own priorities. And those sometimes pull in different directions and don't always focus on prevention. So there's a kind of multiplicity of objectives, so it's just one among, yeah. among many kind Absolutely. of things. I think there's also the, um, one of I think key messages in our report that all the bodies involved in community planning need to play their part in full. Uh, and by that I mean that um, uh, the National Community Planning Group uh, needs to um, be clear about what its revised approach to community planning without focus on prevention and equality is actually means for the statement of ambition. I mentioned that earlier. Secondly, that the Scottish Government and COSLA do develop a, a, a framework in order to assess the performance and pace of improvement of community planning partnerships. We're not measuring that at all just now. And thirdly, that community planning partnerships need to invest more in building mutual trust and capacity, but also to start making the difficult choices about moving resources into, into prevention. You need, you need movement on all three fronts at one and the same time. Okay, that's fine for me. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, to be followed by Mark. Uh, thanks so much, convener. Um, in the What Works Scotland paper, they talk about the whole question about prevention and uh, they say in practice prevention explicitly or implicitly has been around a long time and most public policy has a preventive dimension, including much policy that may not be labelled preventative. So, I mean, that, that makes me think that are we actually, or is anybody all that clear as to what is preventative and what is not preventative? I, I think you're right that there's room for more of that clarity, and I think for me that links back to the point we make in our report about the need for more planning for outcomes under the framework of the um, of Scotland performance. Everything that's in there is an outcome. It, it's all about making life better for the people of Scotland in different groups and in different ways. But in our audit experience, the extent to which that's underpinned by the detailed planning that says in order to do this, everybody who can influence it has agreed what they will do and how it hangs together varies. So from um, two recent reports of mine on renewable energy, we found the government had a great record of being very clear what it wanted to achieve, what the levers were that it had, and how it would m measure that over a long period of time. That's not to say that it all happens like this because they're complex things, but the clarity was there. In relation to housing policy, we found there was less clarity and less alignment of all the people with an interest in it. Now, that may be because housing is a more complex problem to solve, but the, the, the underpinnings of the outcomes we think varies, and there's scope to increase the clarity about if that's the outcome you want to improve, what, what is the best, um, best guess, if you like, about how you will do that, based on the evidence, based on experience, based on the insights of people doing it, and how will you measure and monitor that to make sure it is moving in the right direction. That's what I think we're looking to see in terms of really being clear about what the preventative activity is in shifting each of those outcomes and understanding better the choices and trade-offs that are involved in that. I mean, I think a lot of us would, our gut feeling would be that housing is a pretty good one for preventative spending because you're going to help, probably help education, probably help health, probably help budget, family budget. Mm -hmm. So that whatever studies there might be, the gut feeling would be it is. Whereas something like a hospital, I have more questions about because, I mean, we're, we're spending, what is it, 700 million on the Glasgow South... South 842. 842, <laughs> I'm corrected. A, a large amount of money on a new hospital on the south side of Glasgow. Now, can we call any of that preventative? Or can we call it all preventative? Or can we call none of it preventative? I mean, have you got a feeling on that? I think it's exactly the right question. Um, I, I think if you ask a group of healthcare professionals and social care professionals, none of them will say, we don't need hospitals now and we won't need them in the future. But I'm very interested in if we, if we take what we've got now and then say in 20 years' time or actually under the policy in 2020, we have a vision where lots of the older people who are currently being admitted to hospital will not need to be. Do we know how many of those older people are there because there is currently no alternative and how many are there because they need exactly what a state-of-the-art hospital like the New Southern General can um, offer? And 
um, of the people who could be somewhere else. What is it that we need in terms of geriatricians working in the community, in terms of different sorts of care settings, in terms of investment in housing to make it safer to stay at home for longer or to use telehealth to monitor somebody's well-being, in terms of um, home care workers, in terms of uh, genuine community support from communities themselves? Do we understand how much of that demand is avoidable and what we would need in order to be able to avoid it? I think the answer is no. Now, we're not alone in that. That's not a criticism of this government. It's hard and complex stuff. But I think that's the work that's needed in that one example and in the range of other things where we also want to um, improve outcomes by preventing problems in the first place. I was just going to make the same point about, about um, crime, the criminal justice system, that uh, reducing criminality is the responsibility of the police, but the causes of crime are right with the control of the police. I mean, bad housing, poor education, bad parenting skills, poor health, bad planning. That's where community planning can make a difference in terms of preventive work. How many people have got into the criminal justice system because of these factors further back? And if they'd been addressed further back, then hopefully the, the number of the people who commit offences would have been reduced. That's the essence of, of, of a longer-term approach to community planning. I just wonder if we need to do any more studying. I mean, the suggestion seems to be that we need to look at this more and we need to understand it more and all the rest of it. But, I mean, we are agreeing broadly that we all want preventative spend. And, I mean, your own report yep. uh, early on, it says um, discussions about targeting these resources at, at their priorities and shifting, shifting them towards preventative activity are still in the early stages. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, if we're serious about shifting resources, do we not just have to say... Right, the spend on hospitals and accident emergency next year will come down 2% and that money will go to preventative spending or GP practices or wherever we want to put it. Do, do we not need a bit more kind of hard-edged somebody making that kind of decision? In a sense, yes. I, I'm not suggesting we need more research evidence or more studies or anything else. What I think I'm saying is that in each part of Scotland, we need that very clear understanding that says this is what we're going to shift and here's how we're going to do it. Now, it may be that in some parts of Scotland the answer is to say we will collectively agree we'll spend 2% less on the hospital as a whole or on A&E and we will, we will take that out and spend it on something else. But th that needs to be a collective decision that's based on an understanding of what that's likely to do to A&E waiting times, to demand for social care, um, to be able to respond quickly to keep people at home. The, the problem sticking with that example is that if you don't do that thinking then actually you can't take two percent out of A&E because people will keep on turning up at A&E who have got real needs. Are the people turning up A&E because we keep putting money in, more money in there? I, I would say not. I would say it's because we're not putting money into the alternatives. We know we've got in the report we published last year on reshaping care for older people a great example from Perth and Kinross where the council has worked with the health board to, to really use the data to home in on the relatively small group of older people who do keep on being readmitted to hospital and getting stuck there, to work with their GPs to understand what would help to keep those people at home, and then to invest a quite small scale into the, the sorts of services that, that the GPs, the home care workers, the social care managers think would be needed. And you can see the trend in the data that helps you avoid um, those admissions and to keep people safer and with a higher quality of life at home. Now, the challenge comes when you try and take that money back out of the health service and put it somewhere else, because the focus is on how many patients are being treated, being discharged from A&E within four hours, on the length of time that um, people are waiting for elective treatment. I think you can make small changes at a local level in exactly the way you discuss. But if I was the chief exec of a health board, I'd be very concerned about something which was going to blow my performance against those heat targets out of the water without um, having an understanding of what the impact might be and without there being a wider acceptance that we need to think about whether all of the things we're trying to achieve are coherent and consistent. So should we as the politicians then just make the decision that for the next five years we're going to be relaxed about a and &E, uh, targets all being missed because we're going to put that resource into... I mean, is that, is that leadership that we need to give? I'm... I'm I'm not the politician and I am an accountant. What I would say is Same I wouldn't... <laughs> 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 I 
allegedly. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say, let's be relaxed about missing the A&E targets. I'd step back and say, is 95% within four hours the right target? Is there a clinical reason for it? Would it make sense actually to say 90% within four hours and work towards that? Or indeed to differentiate it for different types of people? W could you come at it a different way and say, do we really understand how many of the people who turn up at A&E need to be there or could be there at a much lower level of support using um, NHS 24 more effectively or GP walk-in centres. Um, the Public Audit Committee has been looking at our work on A&E recently and actually there's very poor information about people who self-refer to A&E and the reasons why they're there. It's the sense of not knowing enough at a local level about what the demand currently is so that you can identify what can be diverted altogether and what you could treat better by going upstream and doing prevention. No, I mean, these are fair points. On, on the question of going back to the, the CPPs, I mean, if a CPP in any area decided, you know, we as a whole would really like a sh that kind of shift, you know, out of secondary care into primary or whatever, I mean, does the CPP have really have any power to make that decision? No. no. I mean, it's interesting, there's a provision in the 2003 Act which allowed a CPP to apply to Scottish ministers to become an incorporated body, to become, a, in effect, a statutory body. None of them have ever applied to become, to become so. Uh, and, a, you know, one part of the CPP cannot dictate to the other its priorities. They're, they're, you know, council has priorities, the health board has priorities. It's, it's at the margins, it's where the budgets overlap, that they can make a, make a difference. But I still feel, I think we both feel, we can still make a huge amount more difference by by focusing on those areas where budgets do overlap and that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a first step but effectively and then you're saying each member of the cpp has a veto over its own budget or well, whatever unless, unless they're i mean unless they're unless i mean point there unless they're prepared to agree right uh, and then they've got the issue say the health board uh, representatives what that does in terms of their accountability to the minister what authority do they have in the cpp that can gain say what the minister wants to do. That that's where it gets really really, really difficult. One of the one CP which is uh, which is well advanced has I think to some extent come to that point in time. They want to move further forward, but there's a limit in terms of the degree of discretion they have as a CPP. You, you follow what I'm trying to say? Yes. In, in terms of, of ministerial direction or indeed the priorities of, of other partners around the table. Yes. So I mean, we could take one. Well, take Glasgow for my, my case, where all the other partners agreed that there should be a shift out of secondary care into primary care, yeah. but if the health board felt under whatever pressure that they couldn't do that, then mm. it's not going to happen, is it? Mm. There's nothing to stop the agreement being made if they all sign up to it. They've clearly got that. But it's um, got to be 100%. It's got to be 100%. And I think it would be a brave chief exec of a health board who is willing to say, don't worry, the, the heat targets are what I'm held accountable for, but I'll manage them because it's very clear that that sort of shift would have an impact on the short-term targets and the, the need to break even every year on revenue and capital, and it's that that the Chief Exec is held to account for by the Cabinet Secretary. Now, that accountability is very clear, and there's nothing wrong with it. What I think we've questioned in our NHS reporting is whether the short-term targets and the financial um, targets are compatible with reshaping care towards prevention for older people. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, to be followed by Richard. Uh, thanks. I want to maybe just touch a little bit more on this um, the, the discussion around um, inputs versus outcomes and whether we're, we're looking at the right things. I mean, in terms of that shift that, that, that you feel needs to happen, who, who, ex who, who do you envisage leading this discussion? Because I think, you know, surely you would accept it's very difficult for a government, for example, to turn around and say, actually we probably shouldn't worry too much about this target area our focus should be over here because you can you know you can see the narrative that would follow the, from that what, what 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 view do you take on where the leadership on that discussion needs to come from and how do you achieve buy into that discussion I, I think it has to operate at all levels um, clearly government has got a central role in this government policy directs and should be directing what all of the other public bodies do and what they do in partnership. Um, and I think the outcomes approach in setting those clear directions and the longer term view has been a really um, strong move that has helped to build people's thinking about what public services are for and how you make best use of the 40 billion or so we spend on them every year. Um, 
I think for government itself, as we say in the report, there is more to do to make sure that the policy making towards those objectives is um, aligned, is joined up, and really understands what the impact of individual policies will be on each of the outcomes to get that joining up. But equally, I think, as we've been discussing, at a local level, at the community planning partnership level, and more locally than that, that there's, there's work that can only be done at that level to really understand what the needs are there, what resources you've got, what the local characteristics are in terms of remoteness and rurality and deprivation and so on to work with. Um, I think across the piece, though, there, there probably is a, a type of leadership that we need more of in this context, which is saying, with the resources we've got, we cannot do everything. We have to make choices, and here are the choices we're making. <laughs> We know that um, politics is, is not easy. That's what all of you do every day. But I think there's something about opening up the conversation with the public about the choices that we, that we have to make as a society, about the different trade-offs that are involved in that, and about why, for example, although we, we all have a, a very strong attachment to our local hospital, that may not be the best place for most of us most of the time. There are some things that can only happen in a hospital, but for most people, other sorts of care and support are likely to be better. I think the, the challenge is to move away from the short-term response of government and the other political parties, the opposition parties, to always focus on the, the thing that we're losing rather than the thing that we're gaining in a shift to prevention is a tough one to crack and it's not something that I think we can help with much apart from providing more information to inform the debate. I, I appreciate, appreciate the point, but perhaps just at the very end there, I mean, I remember from my time in, in the council chambers that you had your statutory performance indicators, which were obviously the things you had to measure. There were the key performance indicators, which obviously linked to key council objectives. And then there were discretionary indicators which members would occasionally request information on at meetings. And I remember one particular meeting asking about a, uh, an indicator and saying, why do we measure this? Why are we measuring this? And the response was, because we have to. <laughs> you know, there, there didn't seem to be a defined, yeah. uh, you know, the, uh, the, which wasn't really the nature of the question I was asking, but that was the response that came back. We have to measure this. Has there been enough work, do you think, done looking at the sort of broad suite of what is measured by local government by health boards, etc., and a real evaluation of of the value of those measurements, because I think that's the kind of work um, that would really help in any discussion that does take place. Is having some kind of bedrock of work there that says, "Here are the things that are being measured. Here's the essentially the value of those measurements in terms of the preventative agenda and the shift that we want to see." Can I maybe kick off on local government? Caroline can come in on the rest of the public sector. I mean, I think the, uh, the point you made, um, we, have, we measure it because we're told to measure it, it, it was, was probably true in the past. And the, the Accounts Commission never felt comfortable about specifying uh, performance indicators because the ownership didn't lie with c councils. You're with me. They were doing it because the Accounts Commission told them to do it. So I think three or four years ago, um, we said to Solis and Kozla, you take ownership of this. You take responsibility for benchmarking. You develop the performance indicators. I think there's still a bit to go in terms of making sure the indicators are what the public necessarily want to know. You, you follow me? And the, the, the reflect what our priorities for the council, uh, for the public. For example, there is no performance indicator on the cost of burials. And that, that's an issue that is, is close to people's hearts, for example. Um, but that's improved, and they've developed families of, um, of, uh, of, of benchmarking councils. And I think what we've seen is, a, is an ownership that has been taken by local government. They resisted it to some extent to start with. They're a bit wary about the fact that the information about their performance would be in the public domain. Well, it should be in the public domain. The public have a right to know how well councils are performing, in, in, in not only against comparable councils, but over time, is the council is the council actually improving? So that's been a positive shift. There's still a way to go. And I think there is scope for developing performance indicators in relation to community planning as well. And there's been some initial work has started in relation to that as well. So I think if the ownership is with the uh, councils and we can transfer that similar ownership to community planning partnerships, and community planning partnerships actually start saying, well, how are we performing? How do we compare with a similar community planning partnership? That's a direction of trouble I think we should all support. I agree with that entirely. 
entirely. Um, following from our report, the National Community Planning Group is um, leading a review of the various frameworks which um, the partnership bodies are all um, either using themselves or are required to use in terms of performance monitoring, reporting and accountability um, with the aim of looking for opportunities to rationalise it first of all and to make sure it is measuring the right things. That's a really positive move and it clearly will need to be able to flex to reflect the local priorities that individual partnerships have set themselves. Um, I think it also needs to um, really link into the non-partnership um, frameworks like the HEAD targets, uh, like the targets that Police Scotland are operating to, just as a couple of examples, where there is a risk at least that the targets that an individual body is operating to conflict with or are in tension with those that the partnership is working to, because we need to be clear about how we're going to resolve those tensions. Okay. So in, in just over a year's time, there will be a, a Scottish election. A, a year subs following that, there will be uh, a local government election. And obviously, the, the very uh, is much more preferable or much more easy to go to people and say, here is what we have done uh, and here is what has been delivered, rather than to say, here is what we have done and here is what we expect to be delivered in five to ten years' time. Do you think preventative spending is a hostage of the electoral cycle? I don't think it makes it any easier. Um, we can see currently the focus there is from all parties on things like A&E waiting times being um, looked at previously quarter by quarter, monthly, increasingly, at even sort of shorter intervals, and I guess in future in real time as technology makes that more possible. I, I think there's something very important about all of us exercising the leadership we were talking about before, not to lose sight of those measures, but to think about them in the context of the bigger outcomes that we're trying to achieve, um, to understand the trade-offs between them, um, and to not let the, the short-term temptations get in the way of the ability to do the longer-term things for, for the good of the people of Scotland that we're all here to support. We're never going to do without politics. Nobody's suggesting that, and it brings all sorts of um, benefits and consequences with it. But I think trying to move the debate onto the longer-term one to be clearer with people about the choices that have to be made, it's what politics is all about, and the trade-offs in there, is one of the counterweights there is to that, the focus on what you can measure today rather than what might be different in 20 years' time. Okay. Mm, okay. Know, Mr. No, no, I... Richard, we followed by Jean. Thank you, convener. You've both talked um, about the uh, uh, the need to shift resources, the difficulty in doing that, and the difficulty in taking some of those challenging budget decisions. I mean, but additionally to to, to that um, uh, area where there needs to be progress, um, is there more that could be achieved through more innovative approaches to funding, <coughs> through partnership working, or indeed through? I mean, for, for example, a few years ago. All the talk was about social impact bonds, remember, where you would, uh, an a, a public sector agency could borrow against the anticipated savings through, for example, um, projects to reduce reoffending uh, and approaches like that. It doesn't seem to have flown from what I can see. And I wondered why that was and, and to what extent, you know, the, the public sector agencies, government in general, is doing enough to look at more innovative approaches to, to funding preventative measures. We've, um, we've talked a lot about politics this morning for obvious reasons, um, and I think that the sorts of political considerations that have come through our discussion several times today are one of the reasons why things like social impact bonds are very difficult to, to make work in practice, the uncertainty that comes with it, the in inability to bind future governments, the, the lack in many cases of a real alignment about what people are trying to achieve, how far the financial return and the social return are the same thing, I think is something we don't understand well. Having said that, I'm sure there is scope for more innovative types of funding in different ways in different places. Um, there's a lot of thinking going on, I know, in government and some, some good examples of early innovation around um, uh, different types of bond financing for housing to, to open that up and to get more investment in to, in ways that compensate for the market failures that are at the heart of housing problems in the UK um, and to allow more investment than the, the constrained short-term picture would allow for. So that's one example. That probably wouldn't work elsewhere. 
There have been examples like the change funds for early years and for older people services. We think, um, particularly in relation to older people, where we've done a, a fair bit of work, that the way those change funds have been used really isn't thinking about how you leverage change from the relatively small amount that's available in the change fund each year, about 300 million over uh, four years, against the 18 billion over the same period that's being spent on health and social care. So I think if, if you were to say this is the amount we've got to lever to lever change where would that have the most impact rather than where can people respond most easily? You might be able to get more change as a result of that. Um, again, it's, it's a, a, a good example of this inconvenient thing that there is no one solution that fits all, but absolutely accept the point that we need to think about how we do things differently if we're going to square this circle we've got. So in terms of innovative approaches to funding mechanisms, to um, financing uh, that kind of um, approach... Again, it's short-term thinking, saying it's a key problem, the inability for government or CPPs whoever, to have a, a longer-term, a 10-year approach to, to that, kind of, that kind of measure. I think it's partly that and partly also the, um, the fact that we haven't yet got a, a clear enough understanding of the bigger picture that we're trying to change. There's no doubt that the £70 million that was spent in 11-12 on the change fund for older people made things better in some places, no question about it. I think there's a big question about whether it helped us very much in terms of reshaping care in the ways that the convener and Mr Mason were asking about. Um, and I think we need to be thinking about innovative funding in terms of that ability to really leverage change rather than to do good things at a local level or, as Douglas has suggested in some cases, to prop up budgets. Okay, thank you, Convener. Thank you. Uh, Jean, to be followed by Gavin. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Convener. I think it's slightly um, following on from what you've just said, but uh, earlier on you said, Caroline, to open up the discussion with the public much more, and that's one of the things that really interests me because in the area that I represent there are some extraordinary uh, really good examples of at a very local level people taking action themselves to, to address a problem and a, a real commitment I think to be involved in finding answers to, to problems but I, but I wonder my, my experience hasn't been a, a absolutely thrilling of community planning partnerships and their relationship to the public. Not that they themselves aren't making things work, but often um, and I wonder if this is right, that they that they have an obligation to kind of present a, a, a report to the public or, or what they're doing or, or to hear some of the problems and somehow go away and solve them rather than have that genuine kind of dialogue to listen sometimes to you know, ordinary people and what their solution might be. I, I think you're spot on. Um, I think I think doing what you're describing is the driving force behind the Community Empowerment Bill. And I have to say, we haven't seen many examples of that really open um, sort of sharing of a problem. Honestly, this is this is what we're trying to reconcile. We've got this much money. We have these many older people who are this much older than they were in the past. And here's our vision of what of how we could do it better. Tell us what you think. I think pe people in public services, for understandable reasons, are often wary of talking about the problems as opposed to the, the successes around it. Um, I understand why that is, and I think it tends to be self-perpetuating. Um, in my experience, where people have been open about the challenges, people, members of the public, the community understand that. We all face the same sorts of issues on a much smaller scale in our personal lives. We recognise that public services can't do everything that we might like them to. Um, my predecessor as Auditor General, Bob Black, um, back in 2012, I think, took part in an exercise of citizens' juries where he was um, presenting information about the public finances and likely trends in future um, and the sorts of choices that were likely to come from that. And actually, the, the experience of the people who took part in it was that they found it fascinating to understand more about why we can't carry on building hospitals like the Southern General around Scotland and expecting that to be the answer to our health and social care problems and got very engaged in, so what could we do differently? What matters most to me? What is it about the hospital that I value? How could I get that somewhere else? Um, there are community groups that can do that. I think technology makes it possible to open it up much more widely than it, than it has been. Um, thinking about the role that the churches and faith groups can play 
as, as part of the solution in all of this. I think there's room for much more innovation in that way than we've seen so far. And personally, I don't think there's an alternative. I think we are reaching one of those stages in the development of our society where we have to be more frank about what is most important to us and what we're going to trade off for that. Um, otherwise, the politics gets increasingly sterile, I think. I, I, I agree with that. I think, to some extent, the debate between... Um, councils in particular and the communities have been a bit one-dimensional. It's about the choice of cuts mm -hmm. rather than uh, what are your views on how services may be provided in a different way. There are some good examples of that. Orkney Community Planning Partnership through the council have been discussing with local communities about the possibility of local communities taking on some of the responsibilities of the council to keep the service, service going. Um, and the need for that, because budgets are getting tighter and tighter and the choices are getting harder, the need to engage even more with communities as to their views not only about priorities but how the service could be delivered in a different way is even more important now than it, than it ever was. I think councils have been good at satisfaction surveys, but they've not been good at looking at the user experience. What, what was the quality of your experience of con working, contacting the council? How could that be improved? What we can learn from that? How, how can we make improvements to that? I, I, think, um, I think it's really important for, for councils, health boards, all public service partners to develop more of that listening mode to the community and to understand that they've got interests and they understand the realities of finance but they've, they, and they're given an opportunity to influence the shape of services, which is precisely what Christie talked about, that services should be designed, designed around the individual and the community rather than by the producer. Just following on from that, if I may, uh, convener, would, do you think that there's a need to be much clearer in our communities about uh, about these agencies and how they and how they operate, and at, at what because there's, as we all know, there are some community councils that work exceptionally extraordinarily well, really, and achieve quite a lot in their community with very little, and um, there are others that, that that people just don't kind of engage with. And how do we see? Um, the role of that kind of democracy right through the whole piece, and how how would you suggest that that, that should be written in, you know, from a, a, at a kind of government level, then to to encourage councils to make that shift away from, you know, the public consultation, meaning do you want your library or do you want the snow clearing or whatever, to a, to a much greater engagement. Well, I mean, there, are, there will be new duties in the Community Empowerment Bill on, on each of the partners involved in, in community planning. I think one of the weaknesses, it seems to me, in the bill is um, what happens if one of the partners doesn't play their full part. There doesn't seem to be any default powers in, in the bill to say, well, that wasn't good enough. Where's, where's the accountability in relation to that? That's why I think we're, uh, we've argued that the COSLA and the Scottish Government do need to develop this, this national performance framework so you can to some extent, whole community planning partnerships to account for the way that they, they actually they actually perform. I think that that would be that would be helpful. Part of it, is, I suspect, um, a, is the way that in which we train professionals um, in in the colleges and in the universities that the the the, um, the um, customer isn't seen as the most important person in, in that process. Um, you know, dealings with planning officials can be. You know about inflexibility rather than actually seeing the problem from the point of view of the pe person who's applied for planning permission. Um, I, I just think it's the, the need to um, improve the quality of training and the understanding within public bodies about who comes first. It is the, it's the, the user. Uh, you're not going to satisfy the user every time, but the point should be to try and find a way around the problem rather than simply saying, no, we can't do it. That, that's, a, that's a difficult process. And it's it's not made easier because, to some extent, um, you know, councils are in a difficult place. Um, they have to balance the budgets by law, uh, so they're looking for savings. Uh, and I think they look for savings first, rather than saying, "Is there a different way of doing this, which can a achieve some saving, but also keep that service going, perhaps in a different way?" And that's a mindset that takes time to change. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you. Um, Every department from every organisation who has given evidence to us will effectively say you shouldn't touch our budget because what we do is preventative spend. Is there an Audit Scotland definition 
of preventative spend? And if not, should there be? There isn't one. Um, I would say, and you won't be surprised to hear, I don't think there should be. I think for me it comes back to the conversation we had earlier about the organisations themselves when they're claiming that should be able to show how it's preventative. Um, we were having a, a conversation earlier about the fire service, for example. Now, we know that in Scotland there's been a huge reduction in deaths from fire over um, a, a long period of time, and that's a huge success story, and it raises important questions that the fire service is grappling with about what it's for now. I'm not sure we know enough about what's led to that reduction in fire deaths, whether it is the great work that the fire service has done to go out and advise on fire safety, whether it's different building standards, whether it's the greater use of oven chips rather than chip pans. I don't know that. I'd be interested in whether the fire service does. But without that information or parallel information, I think it's a push for organisations to expect you to believe that their spending is preventative. That's not to say you can pin down every pound, but you should be able to say we do things, but we do these things because they prevent those things in the way that Glasgow is starting to be able to around its community planning process. Okay. Uh, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I didn't think there was a definition, but I just, it just strikes me that unless we sort of get to some form of consensus on it, then we'll, we'll just accept everybody's definition and, uh, and it's harder to move forward. Um, just specifically then, in, in terms of the, the work you've done, I mean, you know this committee has been pretty interested in disinvestment. I mean, you, you referred to it in, in one of your first answers. I mean, over the, the work that you've carried out, have you seen any sort of positive, specific examples of disinvestment? You gave some good examples of collaboration and, and mm. where, where services overlap, people talking about how um, they can make the money go further. But do you have any good concrete examples of disinvestment? I think the best example I can refer you to is the one I touched on earlier around reshaping care for older people in Perth and Kinross. Um, I, there's lots of anecdotal evidence around, but we've looked at that one quite closely. Um, and I think what's really interesting about that is three things. One, the extent to which it is based on really strong and local, almost individual data to understand where, where the problem is and where you can make the most difference. Secondly, it's very collaborative. It's not doing it to people. It's sitting down with the GPs and the GPs with their, with their patients, with the people who are affected here, and talking about what would make a difference. And thirdly, it really does require very close joining up between the council and the health board to understand how um, the, where the money will come from, where it will come from short term if there aren't reductions in the spend in the hospital this year, as there may well not be, and what the understanding is in the longer term to, to make the bigger shifts that will let you reinvest. That's a really strong example that I think depends on each of those three factors. I'm sure there are others, but that's what I point you towards. One I would mention was in Falkirk, where the health board, again the health board and the council, it came together, consulted with local communities in, in Bowness, if I remember correctly, and enabled people um, in consultation with them to live much longer in their own homes, are you with me, thus reducing the, um, the demand on public money. Can I just go back to your point on the definition? If you, have, if you have a definition of that, everybody will claim everything we do is preventative. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope, I think, that one. You know? Okay. say actually that the Scottish Government and uh, COSLA in their statement of ambition guidance has said that uh, in their view preventive approaches are defined as and I quote actions which prevent problems and ease future demand on services by intervening early thereby delivering better outcomes and value for money which is quite simply put and of course uh, um, the what what works uh, Scotland they've uh, they've also got a definition provided by Nesta which says preventative approaches are those which intervene to curb the development of social issues and challenges when preventive programs are targeted at solving well research problems and are strategically led and delivered they can have an enormous impact on service delivery providing a cost effective use of taxpayers money so I think we've got a good idea of what we're actually trying to achieve through through those uh, two definitions uh, that ends my question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gavin. Thank you, and thank you to colleagues around the table. I just want to ask before we wind up this uh, session if there are any further points uh, uh, that either of you would wish to make to the committee. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, very much um, for your um, evidence uh, this morning. It's been uh, fascinating, I must say. I'm going to call a suspension for a couple of minutes to allow an, uh, an actual break for members and a changeover of witnesses.
Okay, I shall reconvene uh, the session. We will now continue our consideration of preventive spending by taking evidence from Professor James Mitchell and Professor Kenneth Gibb from What Works uh, Scotland. I'd like to welcome both witnesses to meeting and I invite one of them to make a brief opening statement. Gentlemen. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'm just going to say a few words to amplify on the executive summary of the paper that, that we provided to you. So just to start by saying that What Works Scotland's a collaborative venture from the Universities of Glasgow and Edinburgh, but is really a network of academic and practitioner partners across uh, the, uh, uh, Scotland. We are uh, involved in essentially trying to use, develop and use and understand evidence to make better decisions about public development and uh, reform. We're funded by the ESRC and the Scottish uh, Government. And, and essentially, we start from the, the, the Scottish approach to public policy as being our, our kind of starting point. And clearly, prevention is absolutely uh, at the heart of that. And as we say in the executive summary, and as was discussed in the previous uh, session, our view would be that prevention is by no means a new idea, but it is something that's now central to that uh, Scot uh, Scottish approach. There seems to be, as we've heard this morning, a, a, a large degree of consensus about the aims and objectives of uh, pre prevention. The problem is when you start to dig into it, uh, that's, that's where it starts to get much more uh, complex. Uh, I won't say any more about de de definitions. The Chair has just talked about them. I think the point I would make, though, uh, in addition, is that we see prevention as a question, as a kind of wicked problem, a kind of classic wicked problem. It's a hard thing to pin down in how you define it. It's a hard thing to work out what exactly you want to do about the problem as you, as you understand the problem. The framework of the causality between the nature of the problem and the solution can often be difficult to unpick. And really, it's situationally specific. It depends on the place you're looking at. It depends on the sector you're looking at. It depends on the time period that, that you're looking at it. And that means that there probably aren't general silver bullets or, or, or single answers to these questions, but a need to empirically examine each issue in each uh, realm as, as you go along around a set of general uh, principles. So in the paper, we look at a number of illustrations of evidence of the, the sort of areas that, that there is uh, academic and other uh, grey literature uh, evidence about, and James can talk about them late, later on if that, if that, that would help. Uh, for my part, I've been quite interested in the economics of pre prevention and looked in particular at some of the, the interesting work that uh, Health Scotland have done recently about uh, thinking about health inequalities and how you could use prevention to try to address some health health inequality issues, suggesting that there are cost-effective routes in, into that, that there are ways of achieving that without reduce, you know, at the same time as reducing inequality, but that, as again was indicated in the previous sessions, often hard to find savings, to target those savings, to ring-fence them, and then to actually use them in a preventative way. That's, that's where often the challenge uh, uh, comes. We... Uh, also, I think under point 110 in the executive summary, we would like to stress this caution about sort of short-termism, that because of the wicked problem nature of a lot of prevention issues, uh, it's actually hard to pin, pin down a kind of timetable for, for outcomes. And we think that one of the ways in which uh, prevention can be made progress, can we, we can make progress with it, is to embed it into the kind of culture and the nature of our organisations as a process. So that by changing the kind of mindset, as somebody said previously, actually uh, is probably a more uh, compelling way to move forward, to make, make prevention part of the everyday life of public sector uh, del delivery. But it's about how you, how you embed that within institutions, and it's about how you embed that in the leadership of those institutions, and how you make it part and parcel of uh, the way that parties co coll collaborate as in community planning pa pa partners. Uh, there's a really interesting... Uh, discussion by the New Economic F Foundation uh, about the kind of principles of, of prevention. And on our last page, we've pointed to on this four bullet points uh, on page 14, which kind of point to the, the kinds of challenges that exist for trying to make prevention embedded into the system and to transition towards that uh, greater use of uh, prevention. And that's about uh, trying to measure uh, the benefits, the costs, the trade-offs of, of prevention compared to standard practice to better understand the barriers to, to prevention, uh, culturally, socially, economically, politically. Uh, it's about trying to build alliances around uh, pre prevention, which involves uh, the leaders of organisations, politicians, citizens, the, the, the sort of public uh, uh, debate, 
and it's about also stim 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 stimulating uh, a wider debate about the whole purpose of, of uh, pre prevention. There's a lot more in the paper, but hopefully that gives us a flavour to get us started. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And as you're probably aware, the way the committee works is I'll start off with some opening questions, then I'll open out the session to colleagues who may explore specific areas in greater uh, depth. First thing I'll, I'm going to ask you about is a follow-up to your uh, opening statement with regard to embedding. And you, uh, you talk about the need to uh, embed prevention. Um, I'm just wondering why why isn't it embedded already? I mean, certainly, I mean, as you as you alluded to, this has been talked about for years. I mean, our committee's been dealing with it for five years uh, ourselves. What, what, why isn't it routinely in Scottish uh, um, public life? Um, I think that's that question is a very important question, and it gets to the heart of one of the big issues for us, and that is that there appears to be a consensus, and I think there is a genuine consensus in favour of prevention. And therefore, a paradox, why is it not prioritised? Why are we not moving forward? And I think we do need to ask, um, you know, what's going on here? And I think one of the reasons is that prevention sits alongside other competing demands in public services, um, enforcement, um, um, kind of triage, immediate response, and so on and so forth. So there's all sorts of pr um, pressures on our public servants, um, uh, and prevention is only but one. And I think it is often not seen as <clears throat> the number one priority, um, partly because it is difficult to measure, difficult to show that it's being achieved. And I think, in truth, uh, we are politics operates. Um, we, we prefer to, to look at the easy things to measure. We look at targets. Uh, we had um, Caroline talking about the heat targets and so on. I, I mean, we, we, we could go, didn't go into the chamber today, we could look at the press today, and we could look at the kind of issues in the election that's coming up. It'll be waiting times, it'll be targets, it will be police numbers and such like. And so I think our political culture, and I don't know if this is a fault of any individual, certainly not a political party, certainly not a parliament, I think it's to do with our culture, is that we tend to focus on, on these matters at the expense of, um, excuse me, my, I'm struggling here today, um, at the expense of prevention. And I think, to be honest, I think one of the biggest challenges is kind of changing our culture, both in terms of the political culture, but also the culture, and again, uh, referring back to, uh, I think it was Douglas was saying uh, earlier, uh, the culture within, within our public servants and how we train our servants and how, how we deliver services, how we think about these things. So I, I, I think there's a lot of talk, and I think it's genuine consensus in, in favour of prevention, but ultimately I'm not sure that we really do prioritise it. I don't think we reward it. I think it's very difficult to do these things. Well, given what you've said actually there, and given the, the seemingly endless <coughs> discussions we've had in committee over the, this particular issue, trying to move this issue forward year in, year out, with a whole host of different organisations and Scottish government, local authorities, you name it, um, is there an argument that uh, you know budgets um, to deliver prevention have to be uh, ring fenced. I mean, there are obviously change funds, etc., but there's been discussion made about, you know, they're often used to subsidise other issues and named as prevention. Is there a way in which we could deliver additional resources or specific resources that can't be touched for anything else in order to deliver these long-term um, benefits that we all want to see, but yeah. I mean, it's understandable when budgets are extremely tight and people Absolutely. have to deliver on all the measures that we've already discussed this morning that, that people have to deal with the immediacy rather than think about what's going to make Scotland a better place in five or ten years. So is that is that a potential way forward? Is it, you know, are we going to be, in, as I mentioned in the previous session, five years from now having the same discussions? Um, I think in five years we will be having the same discussions um, because it's an ongoing thing. Mm. I do think ring fencing may be... Hopefully for a different level. One would we'll hope so. One hope so. Though, you know, I was listening to the previous session. Yeah. I, I do recall sort of discussions there about housing. I, I remember 20 plus, perhaps 30 years ago, when Harry Burns was in Glasgow, he made the point about the need to improve Glasgow's health by putting money into housing. And that was a pretty radical and bold move from a man within the, the health sector. So I'm very conscious that this is something that we've been struggling with for a very, very long time. And I think it comes back to that paradox. We all agree it needs to be done, so why doesn't it happen? I think ring fencing, to get to the core of your question, is certainly worth looking at. But I think two two observations on that. First, I think there's always the danger that um, we will 
of people in the public services who will label something as prevention and carry on doing whatever they were doing before. Mm -hmm. um, and that might sound cynical, but um, I think you know that that is that's the reality out there. Um, and also, I think uh, you know that, that it, it won't solve every problem. I think it got it's got to be um, part of a solution, and it may be not the most appropriate in certain circumstances. I think cultural change is important. I think the institutions we need to look at. I do think there are undoubtedly, and I'll pass over to Ken here, I do think in terms of the finances, we have a major problem because we, we have structured our finances in silos. And I think uh, it's quite rational for people working in local government, in health, in police, and so on and so forth, for the reasons that Caroline Gardner gave earlier um, to, to, to respond up the level within their, within their organisations rather than to think collaboratively and preventatively. Um, you know, I, I think there is a major issue there. So I, I think we, I would like to see a bit more experimentation, frankly, and I think we should try to encourage at a local level, and I think it really is at a very local level, um, some innovation. Um, I mean, we don't, won't necessarily want to have to have a massive overhaul of, of, of financial structures, but we do need to look at this and identify perhaps local areas where people are willing to do this. And I, you know, and certainly in the past, uh, interestingly, the islands have often been amongst those who have been most innovative in this respect, most willing to, to take up the challenge. I'm not sure if others they want to take up the challenge I'm putting here, but I, I, I think you know, we, do, we do need to see some of that, um, that kind of innovation. But Ken, maybe on the... Well, I, I mean, I guess what I would say additionally is that there are, from an economics point of view, there are issues about incentives, about who, who has incentives within, say, a community planning partnership to, to act in, in, a, in, a, in a collaborative way, given what James has just said about the kind of uh, nature of, of individual uh, organisational uh, budgets and accountability for that, and, and as was made the point made earlier about the sort of lack of uh, the statutory basis of CPPs, which, which kind of compounds that problem. So what are the incentives for people to... Uh, behave in this more collegiate way so that uh, you know you can ring fence and you can make these kinds of uh, savings that that's a, it's, that's a challenging thing 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 to do and it might be worth uh, well what should the incentives be sorry to interrupt you well, what, what should the incentives what, be what I mean by that is how, how can you encourage people to for instance I mean one of, one of the things we James and I've been talking about recently has is the idea that in other other walks of life for instance in the construction industry Sometimes, in effort to save money, you might have a pooled savings fund. So, if you can cut costs in the in the construction process, the the partners to that savings fund can can benefit from 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 the uh, savings. So, I'm just in I'm I'm just thinking really in the principle, the idea that other ways in which you you, you can pool pool benefits and re, 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 redistribute them. How can you encourage in, individuals to? Uh, change the way they want to be. And one key issue is the annuality of budgets. I, I would have thought it's clearly much harder to um, make these kinds of decisions, which are about longer term timescales when you're dealing in such a short term uh, bu budgeting context. So there's a sense in which you know, the overall, the overarching public finance structure mitigates against what's what's been trying 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 to be done and it creates a kind of present bias that people don't want to take these kind of longer term uh, decisions i used to work in a large uh, private sector company and they had a staff suggestion scheme how you could make the company more efficient and nobody put any suggestions even those hundreds <laughs> but they then put and they changed it so that um, you could get up to 10 percent of the money saved so, yeah. into your salary if your suggestion was adopted by the company yeah. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> avalanche of suggestions yeah. poured in, many of which were implemented, which saved the company money. You know, so that so you know, I, I do appreciate the but I, I how think incentives that's, can I think actually it's a work. Context-specific thing, you know, yeah, it, of course, it clearly but depend but on the type of issue that you're con con absolutely. Um, now, obviously, scrutiny. Uh, you talked about, you know, and I, I mentioned myself the fact that uh, you can have these ring, even if you set up a ring fence budget, people could just name it prevention and do exactly what they were doing before. So you, you talk about in 110 about scrutiny might be more fruitfully deployed to investigate in the embedding of processes that promote prevention, supports implementation, and help transition losers from the process. So what, effectively, what we really need is uh, really much more effective scrutiny in how these but how prevention is actually delivered and how budgets, for example, in terms of disinvestment disinvestment etc redeployed if we're going to actually see changes was that something you yes would... and, and i think probably uh i mean we were i think we were quite struck by the dundee partnership model which we've put in the in the mm -hmm. in, 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 in the paper and, and in a discussion around that that was in a sense also about trying to get an organization in its totality across its staff from its leaders through its through the implementers and the street level bureaucrats as it were that they all had a sense of how their budgets 
were divided between pre broadly preventative and broadly non-preventive, non upstream and downstream spend, and how people could think. Uh, just going through a process of developing strategy for, for organisations and for, for delivering operational levels of it, to think in those terms is, is part of that culture change yeah. that we've been trying to uh, uh, pursue. So it's a long-term long -term gain. Okay. And in 1.7, you say the economics of prevention suggests that the costs, benefits, and trade-offs of prevention have to be clearly understood in each instance. Uh, uh, the implication is that they are not at present. Is that right? How do we actually change that? Um, I mean, Jim, Jim talked about culture changes, but how, how do we actually ensure that, that these um, benefits are clearly understood? Um, well, I think, well, I mean, looking at the literature from the, the health inequalities uh, uh, work that Health, Sc health Scott Scotland has done, it's clearly very difficult. There's a, there's, a, there's a number of steps that you would kind of want in principle to, to, to achieve, and that, that is exactly about that. It's about isolating where, where the, 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 the prevention savings can, can be made, holding on to those pre prevention savings and then re re reallocating them. And that makes a lot, lot, lot of assumptions, and their, their evidence reviews su suggest that there's quite a spectrum of, of ability to, to do that, not just in Scotland or the UK, but uh, acro across the world as, 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 as well. But the, as the new, the new Economics Foundation also said, I mean, this is a, a, a necessary condition, as it were. It's an essential step of trying to try, trying to get, get get there. I think our view would be it's very uneven. I think one of the observations I would make here is that um, when we emphasise prevention, we're often asking public servants to do themselves out of a job, because if they succeed, it's conceivable we will not need those services, or at least not necessarily the services themselves, but other services. Take, for example, one of the interesting successes here, and that's the fire service. Fire service has been successful. We can argue as to the extent to which this was preventative or other factors, as, as we heard earlier, though I do think there's, uh, there's, there's evidence that in Scotland we've seen a significant shift to prevention, certainly in the behaviour of the, the services. Uh, the old days when a fire officer uh, saw his or her job is uh, climbing into a big red van with blue lights flashing and being a hero putting out the fires. That remains part of the job, but a huge part of the job that shifted over a long number of years is to get out into the communities and to prevent. Now, there's a danger for fire officers, and I think we have to acknowledge that, that if they succeed, uh, there may be questions raised as to whether we need so many fire officers, so many fire stations, do we need the number of watches and such like. And I think people are, are, are you know, very much aware of these issues. So, I, I, you know, I think, um, I think all credit, enormous credit to the fire service for that shift. I think one of the consequences of this is one has to look further and say, well, what are the consequences of being successful? And I think uh, all credit again to the fire service because they are reconsidering. They're constantly looking at what is the role of the fire service, uh, broadening it out and actually viewing their service not simply in, in narrow terms as, as, as we did in the past, but their public service. Uh, and I think one of the, and this relates to, to other work we're doing, um, I think we've got to try to shift to, towards a, an understanding of public service within which people will have specialist expertise, whether it's fire officers, police officers, uh, or in the various health uh, aspects. That mu much more uh, embedded kind of notion of a public service is, I think, hugely important, and I hope would, would contribute towards the general shift. I think these things are all interlinked, uh, the collaboration, prevention, efficiency, and so on. Okay. Now, I know you're a couple of hip young dudes, but I'm just wondering where the wicked problems kind of phrase came from and what that actually... Uh... It's, uh, I think it was originally an article that was written in 1972. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well, I mean, essentially, it was... <clears throat> I mean, it's been used in different ways. It's one of these ones which has been defined in different ways. Essentially, it, 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 I mean, it's understood in public policy to refer to to problems that are um, multiple in nature, they're not even res resolved, and indeed there will be many different perspectives, competing perspectives on how to resolve them. In that respect, that's why we would see uh, the whole prevention agenda as, as a wicked problem. Okay, I'm going to open out the session now to colleagues around the table. First person to ask questions will be John, to be followed by Mark. <coughs> Uh, thanks, convener, and uh, I suspect we're going to ask some of the same questions that we asked previously. Uh, you can maybe give us a slightly different angle uh, on the responses. I mean, we, we've had this mention of uh, CPPs, and I think it was yourself, was it, Professor Gibb, who said, uh, you know, this question about who has the incentive to act collegiately. Um, I mean, I got a pretty clear answer in the last session that uh, CPPs are voluntary, that uh, even if nine out of ten agree on one thing, they can't force the tenth to do anything. So... Should we really give up on CPPs and take leadership from Parliament? Or give them more powers? 
I, I certainly wouldn't give Parliament the power, with all due respect to parliamentarians. I think this is something that has to be addressed at the local level, not least because these wicked problems are plural and diverse and will require local responses. Um, so I, I'm, I have to say I, I would not be giving Parliament any more power in this respect. I would be devolving, if anything. I think there is an issue in terms of how we encourage collaboration. Um, I wouldn't get rid of CPPs. I would, I would like to think that we could move towards a situation in which CPPs are encouraged, forced, whatever, to, to work much more collaboratively. Um, the model we have is a voluntary model, effectively, um, and that carries with it all sorts of, of problems. There are also problems, I have to say, if you were to create, say, a, a, a multi-purpose authority, give, say, local government responsibility for all of these, that may solve one problem, but it would undoubtedly create other problems. So I think we've got to be careful. Um, but um, I, I, I do think you, you're right in identifying the nature of the, inst the interinstitutional relations as a key part of the problem. Yes. You know, the, because I, I mean, I really, I'm, I'm at the stage I want to see some action, and I mean, the phrase again was used: a, "We need to empirically examine," which suggests, you know, kind of yet more studies. I mean, my suggestion was: a, you know, could somebody make a decision somewhere that we're going to take, say, two percent off the A um, and E's or hospitals and put it into primary health care? Now, at the moment, the CPP couldn't make that decision if it wanted to. So either we've got to make it here or presumably we've got to give them more powers that they, mm. they could make it. W would both of these be options then? Well, there's certainly options. Um, and I think ultimately that something like that may have to happen. I don't think that involves giving the Parliament more power. You've got the power to do some of that yes. already. <clears throat> I mean, I do think uh, Parliament government has a responsibility here. And I think there's a question here about, for example, heat targets, which are really coming from the centre. I mean, he targets and many of his targets, many of his objectives are coming from the centre. And, and I think, coming back to my starting point about the competing nature of public policy, prevention is only one. I think if there isn't an emphasis on prevention, if we're expecting health boards, if we're expecting local government to deliver on X, Y and Z, teacher numbers in schools, for example, then, you know, you're going to limit what they can do. Otherwise, I, my inclination would be to, to give local authorities more autonomy, frankly, to make decisions, um, but also um, I think we need to look at the relationship between outcomes and targets. I mean, there's an ample literature on this that people will play games um, when it comes to targets. There's also evidence that, that when it comes to targets, targets are proxies. They don't necessarily deliver outcomes. And I think we've, got, we've still got some way to go to understand the importance of outcomes. We talk a lot about outcome-based public policy. We don't do it as much. I mean, we all sit in this committee and have a sensible discussion and we all agree on this. And what you've just said, we all agree with, I think. But um, then we go into the chamber and we all shout at each other. And um, I can't do anything about that. That's well, for you I, to I do something about that. But it does raise an um, issue. I think you raise a very important issue. I think it's about leadership. And I think yes. that, that that is something. And I would love to see um, uh, this committee continue with the work it's doing and then go into the chamber united as one and making these points. And I think it would... A, enhance the status of committees, and B, would probably move this debate on. I, I, I'm not, not naive enough to think that's going to happen just because I'm suggesting it or any else, because you're under other pressures as well. You've but got an election in, yes. coming up. In other areas, we have shifted the budget. I mean, the obvious one is from revenue to capital expenditure sure. that we sure. have, and I think it's been pretty much agreed across the board that we're just going to take so much off revenue, which we could be spending on nurses or could be spending on lots of things, but we're putting it into infrastructure and buildings. Yeah. And I think that has been seen as a good thing. Um, would it be there for, you know, if I stand up and say, let's take 2% off A&E and put it into community health, um, would that be a good way of doing it? Well, I wouldn't be in any way qualified to comment on that particular instance, but you would need to agree as a committee. And I think if the committee was to do that, that would be, that would be worthy of enormous praise, frankly, if you would agree on something like that um, to move in that direction. That would be a, a phenomenal result, frankly. I would love to see that. I, I won't comment particularly on the, the yeah, 2% okay. example because I don't know enough about that. that but absolutely, I think that would be wonderful. Yes, it was off the top of my head. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> Professor Gibb, you haven't... Uh, I don't no, know. If I, I just want, want to, to go that. back to your initial question about the yes. lo 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 localism versus the, the Parliament thing. And uh, I think it's interesting that, that CPPs, in a sense, reflect this notion of a place-based policy, a whole place-based policy, that, that that local level is the place where you can see joined up different kinds of services trying to, trying, trying to work together. And it kind of seems 
intuitively reasonable that you would you need to do that from a bottom up basis where you can understand an actual place rather than try to attempt to do that from from Edinburgh as, as it were the, the other thing is that what we're finding in our case studies and at least three of the four case studies we're doing in depth is that the case studies themselves the local authorities are delving deeper into the lo local level. So in Glasgow, in Western Barnetshire, in Fife, I think, they're, they're, they're all, they're, they're, and Aberdeenshire, all four actually, they're, they're trying to develop neighbourhood level uh, an, a, analysis of, of different kinds. So they actually see the need to almost kind of re reconstitute CPP relationships and ways of thinking about problems at an even more local level rather than going going in the, in the other, other direction. And that's more engaging with local com, com yes. communities. So there seems to be some, some trade-offs here, unfortunately. I mean, I think that's, yeah. the, that's the way it is. I mean, I very much agree with you, the idea that we should be pushing the power down. I mean, do you think, do we need to, do you think CPPs are going to get there eventually then, if we just give them a bit more time, like 20 years, <laughs> or um, should we be giving them more powers or a bit more clout or something like that? I think, I mean, I think the, I mean, my reading of what Audit Scotland has been saying for a number of years is that there is progress being made and there is improvement. It's perhaps un, un, uneven, but there are things that, that everybody's getting, getting uh, better at. Uh, I think, in a sense, yes, more, more power in that CPP uh, boardroom, to, as it were, to get things done sounds, sounds to me to be quite, quite important uh, as, as, a, as a way forward. I'm not quite sure... I haven't really thought through how exactly one does that and, and how, how it works in practice, but that seems to be the direction of travel, certainly. OK, that's great. Thanks so much. It's just uh, following on from what John said, should CPPs be funded directly as opposed to through their constituent organisations for prevention? Well, I mean, I think that's the, the notion of top slicing is certainly worth looking at. I think um, just top slice budgets, how that would be done, that would be hugely controversial, and people would say it's. I mean, everyone's quite willing to do that. I, I, I have else's to say, budget. I didn't mention top slicing. <laughs> I, I, I think they would want that money in addition to what they would get, you know, for their normal delivery of services. Well, that's what I'm saying, that's but you slice would, the, you know. the money they would get and take a section of yeah. that which they would have been given anyway. I'm not mm -hmm. saying anything else. I don't think you can do it. We've got to remember they have to deliver services, and of course, and we, we've got to protect those services. And while we, we're focused on prevention here there's an awful lot of other things that has to be done and the question is how do we sh how do we shift that and, and, and perhaps as a case for taking uh, an element from those budgets which where it is possible and again let's be very clear here some services have been cut much more harshly than others local government has suffered um, much more so than health i mean there's a real question there i mean we're going to be discussing this this takes us into the issue do we ring fence national health service spending um, I think that's a hugely difficult question, but we need to look at that, and perhaps we should be taking an element of that. Certainly, if you speak to people in local government, that's their view. Um, I should would expect, but um, I think we do need to look at that, and, and, and I think we would then need to monitor, monitor it very carefully to ensure that there is evidence that they are making the effort to shift to prevention. And, and I stress evidence that they're making the effort because it won't always be obvious, because prevention... You know, it can, it's difficult to prove that it's happened and it can take time and so on and so forth, which is, again, one of the reasons why there's reluctance to go down this route. OK. Um, thank you. Mark, to be followed by Malcolm. Thank you, convener. Um, so your organisation or your, your approach is called What Works Scotland. Presumably you're also What Doesn't Work Scotland and you have a role in terms of not just highlighting good practice but also highlighting the stuff that isn't working and... Um, do you consider that such a message will be as well received as saying, yeah, this is great um, and we should do more of it? Do you think it will be as well received if you say this is wrong and you should stop doing it? Uh, well, what I think we've found so far is that there's a general uh, enthusiasm and desire for more evidence about the things that people are trying to make decisions about and thinking about the route that they should go, go down. And I think they, they understand the logic of what, what you've just said uh, you know, in, entirely, that we don't want to... We don't want to go down the wrong, the wrong road, as, as it were. So uh, I think uh, we're all clear in the What Works Scott, Scott team that, that we're very interested in trying to differentiate those, those two things and trying to build up, build up evidence in a sense. We, because, you know, the, we, you want to prevent waste. That's, that's part of what this is all about. True, but at the same time, we're all human and local government, national government, health service are all human organisations and nobody likes to be told that the issue that, or the policy that they've developed uh, is either not working or, or at worst yeah. counterproductive. So how, how do you see that being, being a, a conversation that we can have that says, you know, this is not helping the preventative agenda, you need to stop doing that? 
I think um, across the public services there is a reluctance to admit mistakes um, because then they can be uh, people can be uh, uh, under fire, as it were. I think um, I think we need to create safe space in which conversations can take place. I'd strongly take the view that we'll learn a lot more from mistakes than we will from what doesn't work and from what works, because actually it's not always obvious what works. Something might be working, but we don't know what it is that may be making something work, but we can often find out what's going wrong. So I think safe space is, is, is hugely important. I think one of the interesting things to do is to look at a, a policy or a process as it has developed and reflect on that. And I think through that reflection, you can learn a great deal. It is much easier. I've got a number in mind, I don't want to actually name them, but I can think of a number where there has been significant progress made. But along the way, mistakes have been made, lessons have been learned. I think it's much easier to take those examples and to learn from that. And I can certainly think of examples where people I'm engaged with at the moment are in very much doing that. We started here, we're here, how did we get here? What, 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 where did we go wrong? Um, I'm very interested in that and seeing how we can learn from that and that can be, uh, lessons can be learned for others. Um, and I think that, 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 that's um, a hugely important part of what I think we, could, we need to do in the academic community. Developing that as well, do you think there's a, I mean, we, uh, I spoke earlier, I think you were in for the session with the Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission, I spoke about the, the, the potential for the electoral cycle holding some of this progress hostage because you're constantly looking for gratification within a defined time scale as opposed to a longer term, you know, saying, saying to somebody, you'll not see the benefits of this for five to ten years doesn't sell as well on the doorstep as look at what we've delivered over over the last four or five years but in terms of that approach do you think there's a risk that um where mistakes have been identified or um progress has not been as fast as might be anticipated that perhaps things which could have been very good have essentially been cancelled or thrown out because they weren't making progress quickly enough is, th is that a risk that, that has been born in the past I think it's a risk, certainly a risk. I think the electoral cycle, um, I mean, I, I, let me preface this remark by saying I'm very much in favour of liberal democracy, but I do think elections do, <laughs> do create some, some difficulties. Um, and actually, I think we need to broaden this out into, I think the public engagement uh, issue that was discussed in the last session is really important. Um, elections are only one part of it. But um, if I was in your shoes, and frankly, I'll never be in your shoes, and I was contesting an election, I know what I would be doing as you will be doing um, and trying to score points um, off your opponents. That's natural and I think we've got to try and find space beyond that. We can't, we can't wish away um, that which is there in terms of the electoral cycle, but we've got to try and find space and allow people the opportunity to, 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 to learn lessons, to explore where they could improve. And I have to say, you know, uh, you know I think a lot of that actually does take place. I think there's a lot of that does take place. And there is, you know, fortunately, a degree of consensus which we can work with. Um, I, I'm, I'm very much in favour of that consensus and building on that and learning critically um, to move forward. In, in the previous session, uh, we heard, you know, about this problem about trying to get a uh, multi-parliament consensus over over the, the the retention of the same uh, policy and how hard that is and i think i think that's that that misalignment between the the short run search for uh, you know wins quick wins relative to what, what we increasingly seem to be thinking is that a lot of these prevention measures are take take a long time to happen it means that the only the only way through that in a sense is to is to build political consensus around some some of these issues the or or the alternative is as it happened in england in the a, a dozen years years ago when there was a Labour government with a large ma majority they could pursue policies which they imagined would, would last for 10, 10 years. So for instance they, they restructured rents and social housing and that was a 10 year, 12 year plan to, to do that. They could reasonably think they could do that because of the time scale they had but we don't have that uh, luxury and then, as it turned out the coalition government kind of unpacked it, any, you know, unpicked it in, in, anyway but you need you need that in a much longer time scale it seems to me and so you need a consensus to make, make that work but you need the evidence and the argument before you can get there. Yeah. I, I should probably should since Professor Mitchell clarified his remarks uh, preface that my question was not from the basis of wanting to see autocratic dictatorship or so before anybody makes a press release to that effect. Um, can, can I Maybe just to, to wrap up then on, on my questioning, the, the other question that I was asking earlier was around uh, 
how that discussion is led in terms of getting us to the stage where we talk more about um, shifting the, the focus in terms of inputs versus outcomes, in terms of what we measure, in terms of how we measure, and the difficulty that there is for any government of whatever colour in being the ones who are seen to lead that discussion. Uh, do you see the evidence that you're producing as being a kind of bedrock that could lead that discussion uh, or allow that discussion to be led without it having a sort of political tinge to it? Possibly, um, but there's ample evidence out there on the, the value of prevention. I think this is... Um I throw this back to you. I mean, this is this is about leadership, and and it can't just be from government, uh, centrally or indeed locally. It's I mean, if the, let's test this. Is this really something on which there is consensus? Is this something on which there is agreement? And I think the test will be to see, for example, how this committee um, takes this forward. I sometimes ask myself, you know, when I want to be very interesting. I haven't done this, but might I'll go away and do it and look at how how members of the Scottish Parliament behave in the Chamber and what they speak about and what they ask questions about, what proportion is on kind of enforcement types issues, target type issues, and to what extent do, do you prioritise prevention in your speeches and your statements? I mean, I, I, I find myself saying that partly because I've, I feel provoked into saying it, but it'd be interesting. I think we've all got to reflect on what we do in terms of this prevention agenda. And I, I think, I mean, one of the stated goals of this parliament um, was that its committees should be consensual and new politics would build and, and, and try and take things forward. I mean, um, I guess, can I suggest that maybe one of the challenges is for you to lead, well, you've been doing a lot of work on this, as you've been, as you've been saying, you've been doing this for years, but can this be taken a stage further? Can you, this be stepped up? I don't know. So I, I, I apologies, I'm throwing this back at That's you. That's all right, I, I, I see the challenge being thrown down, I'm sure we'll accept it. <laughs> OK, Malcolm, to followed by Gavin. <coughs> I, th I think there is actually a lot of rhetorical consensus around this and has been for some time, but obviously that doesn't amount to very much if it doesn't translate into policies. I mean, I was interested in Professor Mitchell's thing about local authorities' more autonomy to make decisions. Maybe that could be community planning partnerships as well, and per possibly that means easing off on some of the other targets. But even within that framework, surely you, you need to have you know, clear national objectives. Otherwise, I mean, who's to even say that prevention is going to be on their uh, agenda at all? And I suppose, I suppose that I'm thinking, given this is a, such a massive agenda, I mean, is, is there a case at a national level for actually, you know, focusing on a defined number of prevention at preventive? Because, I mean, the thing is, there are so many, and even in your paper, there are so many different examples of preventative spend, and, and some of them could actually be, you know, contradictory. If you take your health examples, you could focus on, um, you know, reducing the rates of coronary heart disease, but that, if you do it in a certain way, that might actually increase health inequality. So do we need to actually say, like, these are our top-level preventative uh, uh, objectives for this parliament and let local people work out the way to do it, but that's what we're all going to concentrate on, you know, rather than try and do everything? I think that's a really interesting question. I think it, it relates to the relationship between the national performance framework mm -hmm. and the single outcome agreements. I think it's, it's right to have broad outcomes at the national level, but there needs to be a local dimension because that which is most important will differ from area to area. And I think that's where I think um, um, we need to, to, to allow some of the more the, the, the priorities to be set. But I do think that, that we haven't really, I don't think we've quite got that relationship between the perform national performance framework and the single outcome agreement's quite right. In a sense, these two uh, developments occurred separately, and I think there is an attempt to articulate the two together, and I think there's still work to be done there. But yes, I, I think we need to look at that. Um, I think, of course, there is a danger of too many priorities as well, and, 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 but, um, and that's where I think the national level is, is you know, dangerous because every local authority, every local community will insist it has a priority and be right to do so. And if that's added into the national one, then the list becomes endless and that would not be a good idea. So I think, I think broadly, as prevention as a, would be one of the priorities I think we should have up there, but permit um, at the more local level uh, to define these and to work out how these should be achieved. I mean, is there, can you distinguish between those? I mean, because people commonly say, oh, well, the difficulty about this is it's all going to materialise so far into the future that politicians aren't really interested. But, I mean, can you distinguish between... I mean, there's been a lot of work, although the Finance Committee wasn't necessarily very generous towards all the work in early years in its recent report, but I know there's been a lot of yeah. activity around 
uh, early years prevention and people are accepting that a lot of that is to do with many years down the, the line and so on. Whereas things like the problems in A&E, I mean, you could argue that preventative activity around that could could produce re results pretty quickly, I would think. So um, do we need to distinguish there between yeah. what's going to inevitably take a long time and what isn't? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the early years, the international evidence would suggest that you will get a quick hit reasonably soon. I mean, mm. not months, but within a few years, you can start to see some, some quick hits. So one of the interesting things is that... Uh, We've often assumed it would take years to see an impact, and the smoking ban, the impact of that came much faster in some areas than was anticipated. Um, so I don't think, I mean, I think it does differ from uh, measure to measure. Um, um, but also, I think, um, you know, I think we've got to be careful here. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I think we, we do need to have the longer term. But actually, we can achieve quite a lot in the short term as well. And I guess there is also a question, I mean, are we moving to prevention simply to save money or to improve life chances? Um, on Christia, and I remember that commission, we were very clear that we did not see um, the shift as simply about saving money. It was also and crucially about improving life chances. Um, I guess I, I raise that because some of the tenors of this morning's discussion, maybe because we had audits, Scotland uh, seemed to suggest it was all, only about finance. And <coughs> on evidence, I mean, I suppose that's obviously what you're in the business of, of providing us with and so on. I mean, do you sometimes have to do things? I mean, I know that the example of the smoking ban, that there was some study, but do you sometimes really have to do things in advance of the evidence? And, and is there a danger if you're always going to have evidence-based policy that you pick on the micro things and not on the macro things? There's certainly a danger that if you are over-reliant on mm. evidence and what's say valuable, mm. you, you may not do a lot of things that perhaps you would you'd probably mm. want, want, want to do. So... Pilots, pathfinders, things, things of that kind would seem to be a sensible way of building evidence before making huge com com commitments to, to, to programmes. That would be a kind of obvious thing to say. I think evidence is important, but a theory of change is important. Yeah. You have mm -hmm. to understand why you're doing it. And the example I often give um, is Robert Owen. Um, Robert Owen, when he set up those schools in New Lanark, didn't have evidence, but he had a theory of change. He understood what was likely to happen. And he went with it, and my goodness, wasn't he right? So I think we sh we've got to be careful here, because evidence is often, uh, well, plural, contradictory, and sometimes it's just not going to always be there. Um, so I think we need you know, a theory of change as well, and understanding what we expect to happen, and have very good reasons for it. But you're right, I mean, we shouldn't just hold back, um, otherwise uh, nothing would ever happen. Um, and that's why I often give the Robert Owen example. Okay, then. Gavin. Just returning to a question Mark MacDonald asked, he um, asked if you were also what doesn't work Scotland, and you said of course you are. Um, I mean, is, is it your plan then as an organisation to publish in an unsweetened format um, case studies or examples of policies or areas that just simply haven't worked? I mean, I'll tell you what I intend to do, because what was is a very broad organisation. I'll continue to do what I've always done, and that is be as constructively critical as possible. Constructive criticism works better than just destructive criticism. I'm, I'm certainly not in the business of saying pointing the finger and saying that, you know, you got that wrong, um, because I wouldn't want anyone to do it to me, because they could have a field day. Um, and I don't think it's at all helpful. So it would be constructive, but I strongly take the view we can learn from experimentation and where we might, might we, have, we, we are still struggling with a lot of this um, and I think one of the key things is to to learn from others where appropriate but without holding ourselves back um, if we've got a theory of change but um, spread that as much as we can two, two things I would also say is that we have a thing called the evidence bank which is part and parcel to what we're doing where we're going to basically have a website. We have a website with uh, evidence reviews and rapid reviews which look at specific issues, issues which come to us from our CPP partners and our other partners involved in what works. And we, we, that, that will provide you know, objective, balanced uh, 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 reviews of, spe of spe specific uh, issues and topics, and also ideas, ways of trying to do things in a different way. How do you best share information across different stat statutory par par partners where they maybe don't want to share information or they have some uh, institutional resistance to it? So how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you learn from that? And also, at the same time, we have our four uh, case study partners of CPPs, but we'll have a number of extended 
all our CPPs who we're working with and we're going to share information. And of course, we want to share trying to understand better why some things don't work and how we can improve proving that. And the more people are involved in that, the better. So there'll, there'll be a, a, a series of processes which will be, some will be on a website and published, some mm -hmm. will be about the CPPs working together and will be, will be, will reach the public domain in different ways. Can I add one little thing? Sure. Well, think about it. Again, one of the ways I would approach this is in terms of, um, I, I don't, I, it's not my job, it's others' job to go out there and look for uh, someone not doing their job properly and auditing them and such like. I think what I'm interested in is why people behave as they do and assume they're actually behaving rationally. Are there structures, are there impediments that force people to behave in a way that doesn't put prevention for, for them? I mean, so much of the discussion this morning has been around that. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, the fact that you guys perhaps are emphasising other things than prevention in your public statements and your speeches and such like. I'm not for a moment suggesting that's irrational. I think it may be quite rational. We've got to understand that and then consider how we can move forward. So it's within, if you like, a broadly, broadly a rational actor model uh, uh, framework that I would, I would operate, and I think we would operate. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Professor Mitchell, you <coughs> said in an earlier answer, community planning partnerships uh, should be encouraged, stroke forced to work collaboratively. <laughs> I'm just wondering, in terms, of, in terms of getting the balance, to what extent would you emphasise encouragement and to what extent would you emphasise forcing once it slips out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think the answer is, is, is I, I, I think there has to come a point when encouragement and it just doesn't work and it's just not working at the pace of speed and so therefore we need, may need to say, right, come on, um, we need some action and force it and such like. I think, um, in a way, the threat already exists. People are well aware this is likely to happen at some stage. Um, one would like to think that that alone will make people behave rationally and change, but it may not. But th there must come a point when I think we have to say this system is fine and good for certain purposes, but we're not advancing as far and as fast, and so therefore we may need to... Um, I don't like the word force, I wish I hadn't used it, but yeah, <laughs> I think we may need to intervene, let's say, yeah. Fair enough. OK, thank you. OK, Fair thank time. you. That is uh, concluded questions for the committee. I'm just wondering if there are any further points uh, you would like to uh, make to us at this time. I've got to, I, just, I think I will go away and just check up on, on how MSPs behave in the chamber. I think it's a really interesting one because I think your role in this, I would stress, is hugely important. As a committee, you've, you've prioritised prevention over so many years. You've put it on the agenda. And I think my challenge, if I may, is to to encourage you to take it a step further to see if you can go up a gear or two. Can I, can I, can I leave it like that? <laughs> I don't want a question on it. <laughs> but yeah, I think that would be quite an interesting experience just to look at that because I do think it is an impediment, uh, um, the kind of political culture. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your, your um, evidence today. Thank you, colleagues, to questions. So I'm going to call a break until 11.30 to enable members to have a natural break and also to have a changeover of witnesses.
Okay, I shall now uh, reconvene uh, the session. Our next item of business today is to take evidence on the implementation of the devolved taxes from uh, Eleanor Emerson, Chief Executive of Revenue Scotland, John King, Registers of Scotland, and John Kenny, Scottish Environment Protection Agency. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting, and members have copies of a written update from Revenue Scotland. So we will move straight to questions, and you've been here uh, many times before, so you, you know the drill. I'll be asking you some questions first, and then we'll... Uh, we'll uh, colleagues around the table will, will, will follow. Um, I actually think it's an excellent report, very comprehensive, I must say, uh, but there are a number of issues I'd want to pick up on. The first one is in paragraph 13, when you talk about being confident you deliver the IT system, operational staffing and all other elements that need to be in place for the collection and management of the two taxes by 1st of April. Uh, can you just confirm that the, all these are now, therefore, in place? And all the elements of the IT system are now developed, okay. and um, we're carrying on with the testing, which, as you know, we were doing from way back in December. We've been involving external mm -hmm. users in testing since January. Um, we'll be f doing further testing with external users next week, um, but very confident that's all going very well, and no issues coming through that are causing me any anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of staffing, we now have all the staff. I'm quite confident we have enough staff to go live. Mm -hmm. um, so even if we have further recruitment in hand, but even if we got nobody else, I'm quite happy that we have the staff we need in order to go live on the it, 1st of April. That's great. E excellent. I'm very pleased to hear that. And I noticed that in paragraph 16, you talk about uh, external user feedback during testing. And since the portal opened, has been overwhelmingly positive. I just wonder if you can give me just an example or two of some of that feedback that you've actually been receiving? Uh, the, the committee may be aware um, the uh, convener of the Law Society's uh, tax committee, so I'm just trying to find my reference, had, uh, had seen the system and had commented that it was intuitive and easy to use. Um, the feedback we've had overwhelmingly is that um, it, it's, a it's a much simpler system, IT system, to use than the one for SDLT. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, those who've been testing it have given us some suggestions which we've taken on board to improve it slightly but, but generally speaking that's been going really well. Yes, I saw Isabel Dunverno's yeah, uh, yeah. comments actually on, it, on the, how user-friendly the system is. Now, you see in paragraph 17 you talk about, uh, th about the system being open for external users and it may reveal additional bugs or issues. Has anything been identified in that regard? Um, it's not we, the, the the bit that I'm talking about. Uh, we, as I said, we're going to do further round of end-to-end uh, -end testing of all aspects of the system next week, involving external users, and it's after that that we intend to open it up to a wider group. Um, and uh, I mean, the testing that has gone on so far has certainly revealed some small issues, things that we were able to tidy up, make clearer, make slightly mm -hmm. easier for users. I would expect that we would continue to find things like that, trap one or two error messages that were confusing. It's, it's, it's at the level of refinement, the system now, mm -hmm. um, and we'll see what comes out when we open it up to a wider community, but we don't anticipate any significant problems. Good stuff. Now, I'm not neglecting the two Johns there. I just don't have any questions for you. I'm afraid that <laughs> colleagues around the table might. We'll just proceed with yourself, Eleanor, for the time being. It's, it's just, and it's just in terms of taxpayer contact, uh, you talked about up to the 26th of February, the support desk had uh, handled an average of 33 calls with steady progress in signing up numbers. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, what the kind of capacity is in terms of call handling and if that's something you anticipate will be an issue or you think it will be, it should be okay. Have you got any indications as yet? Uh, we've done our uh, planning on volumes of calls. We could handle 250 to 300 calls a day if we had to. We could scale the staffing up. Mm -hmm. um, we've looked hard with, uh, with colleagues at the sorts of levels of calls that we could get. We do expect to take higher numbers around the end of March, beginning of April, mm -hmm. you know, we would expect that and we'll make sure we have extra staff online ready to answer calls if necessary. It, since I wrote the report, it's been continuing at a similar level. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, um, it, moving on to paragraph 30, you talk about the change in the cost of IT procurement um, and maintenance and you say that VAT is not going to be uh, recoverable. Um, was there an understanding that uh, it would be recoverable um, at, at one point? And how much is the VAT that's not being recovered? Um, uh, the, there wasn't a, a, an understanding, but the original basis of costing, so a lot, a lot of this goes mm -hmm. back to 
the estimates in 2012 and mm. the figures that were worked out then and then the figures that were developed later, um, we, are, we have been costing everything on a slightly, um, what could I say, artificial basis. Uh, and it was made clear all the way back in, um, uh, in 2012 that we were costing on the basis of VAT become, being recoverable. On the IT system, it's quite clear to us now that it won't be. Um, so I have included the VAT on the IT system. Um, I do have to apologise to the committee. In the table of costs that I've sent you, um, there is a slight inconsistency in the treatment of VAT. Uh, we have included VAT in the IT system costs and I think in some of the costs um, that we are paying to uh, Registers of Scotland for setup, we haven't included, or we think we have not included it consistently for our colleagues in uh, Registers of Scotland and SEPA. The impact of that would be, I think, a maximum of £24,000 out of the £21.2 uh -huh. So I hope it's not materially misleading, but I can write to the committee and correct the figures afterwards. OK, no, that's what I want to know those figures. I mean, I'm, I'm, but I'm the, the, the IT system, sorry, you asked me about the IT system. It's of the order of 200000 I, I can come back with the precise number for yeah, you. Yeah, because obviously, I mean, the, the, the IT costs have gone, um, the figures I have, from £1.5 to £2.266 million. At the most, even if all of it, if VAT was imposed on all that, would be one sixth. There would still be an increase in there. But uh, overall, you, you seem to have come in about one point one million pounds below, um, you know, the, the, the kind of twenty two point three million pounds figure that was that was uh, mentioned. Almost a lot more than the sixteen point seven that was hoped for initially. But that, why, why is there such a significant difference in terms of the revised totals for, uh, for example, the, 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 the kind of uh, staff uh, set-up costs? I mean, that's now 3.742 million compared to a budget of 1.8 million, which is a, a difference of 100%, actually. Um, well, there are a number of reasons. Um, what, uh, as, I, as I was attempting to, to explain um, in my report at, at paragraph 31, mm -hmm. um, the comparison back to the, the 16.7 million and the 22.3 million is, is becoming increasingly strained. Yes. And as the committee is aware, those, those estimates were done in 2012 on a flat cash basis. Mm -hmm. um, without they, inflation, etc. Yes. There's do. nothing to do with inflation. And there have been several scope changes, as the committee mm -hmm. is aware. We're now um, Scottish landfill tax and land and buildings transaction tax are different taxes to their UK equivalents. And there are costs associated with developing those taxes that meet the needs in Scotland. Um, it's not at all clear what if one were to go and ask HMRC to set up today what we are actually setting up, it's far from clear what they would actually be charging to do that because uh, their, their original costing was based on relatively minimal changes to their IT, to their systems and so on because they were costing like for like on mm -hmm. existing UK taxes. Um, so the scope changes are significant as we discussed with the committee in uh, December, November and December, um, the setup costs have been higher than my earlier estimates, and, but we're no higher now. We're at 21.2 million, which is where we were in December, and I'm confident that gives you a good handle on what the costs are for the setup of these two taxes. Okay, well, well thank you uh, very much for that. Um, I'm going to open out uh, the session to colleagues uh, around the table. The first person to ask questions will be Gavin. Thank you. Morning. Morning. Um, just a quick question about the, the overall status of the project, because the, um, the Revenue Scotland report talks about amber green, and, yes. uh, but I think that's from a November gateway. That's right. Whereas the uh, Registers of Scotland w report talks about the project overall being green, um, or at least the Tax Administration Programme Board is reporting a status of green. So the, the project as it stands today, is, is it completely green or is it still kind of green amber with a presumably small number of amber? Uh, we have five elements at amber out of around 600 individual deliverables this week. As we've highlighted before, we do this every week. Sure. If anything turns amber or anything turns red, we take action to bring it back. Um, but there are, five, there are five elements that are sitting at amber today. That's a slightly different basis of assessment what the Gateway Review Report do is they follow a kind of template of, of an assessment and, and different categories 
Um, I have to say I have never ever seen a programme of this level of complexity be given a Green Gateway report um, a few months before it goes live. Sure. I'm, not, I'm not saying it never happens, but I've never seen it happen. Okay, but the, f the five amber you refer to, that, that's comparable then to, the, I think there were 17 amber that, in the last event, the so that, that's the same 17. figure. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, in relation to testing, um, you wrote to the committee after your last yeah. appearance saying, former release of the full system will take place once unit testing involving external users, users is completed. We would expect that former release to take place in late January or early February, as I indicated to the committee. Um, did, I mean, did that happen along the lines of... Yes, of, everything of has proceeded along the lines that I set out for okay. you. Um, in your report, then, you make reference to uh, the letters are S-E-T-S, um, yes. which I think is the, the acronym for the, the lawyers and stakeholders signing up to um, LBTT or landfill or both. It's the name that has been chosen for our, our online tax collection system. It's okay. being called Scottish Electronic Tax System, S-E-T-S. It's it, simply because people like to have names for IT systems. Oh, course, they, they have to have uh, <laughs> names, of course. I mean, but you, you, you put some numbers on it, and I think you've suggested that uh, 483 users from 116 firms have signed up, with 52 in process. How many, in, in order for the, I guess, the system as a whole, that we're gonna, I mean, the tax system as a whole to function, how many users do you think need to sign up? I mean, how, how many lawyers are there effectively likely to be using it based on your 90% of, of online calculation? I mean, is 483 pretty close to what you think is, is likely to be needed or where, where are we? Not yet, but I okay. think I should ask John King to come in here because the best understanding we have is based on registers of okay. Scotland's figures. Yeah, I mean, it's the same, um, pretty much the same user base that will be um, having to sign up and register for land and buildings transaction tax as have to sign up and register for various of our services. Um, interestingly, in terms of solicitor community, it's quite, a, it's quite a small concentrated community. There are five firms which account for about 14% of all our registration business. The top 100 firms, well, 100 firms account for about 55%, and 600 firms account for over 96%. So I would expect that um, between now and certainly the end of March, you would anticipate the bulk of those 600 firms and possibly some more having signed up and registered. And I understand that um, as of today, there are about 181 firms that have registered so far. Um, and with um, just under a month to go, certainly based on our experience in the registers, that's quite good progress. Because a lot of firms will come to this closer to the actual event. Um, and that's by and large just driven by, well, whenever they start to get involved in a transaction that will involve land and buildings transaction tax, that will then focus their minds, which is the, you know, the way they operate traditionally. If they have a need to register, they will. So I, I feel it's a, a positive place to be at this moment in time. Okay, so my next question then was how, how quickly can one sign up? I mean, is it, is it minutes, is it hours, days? It depends on the route you use. Okay. Um, if you are already registered with, with Registers of Scotland's online system, We've set our system up so that you can effectively use your credentials from Registers of Scotland to pull all the data across, in which case it's a minutes okay. type arrangement. Right. However, if you are not in that position, you have to approach us and um, request a, a user ID and we have to post an authentication code out to you. It's all to do with system security, in which case it would take a small number of days because there would be the mail and you would then have to use your authentication code. Um, the majority of our users so far, uh, to, as, of, as uh, John has said, it's 181 firms as of this morning, 690 users. Um, well over half of those have registered by, have, sorry, signed up to the system by using um, their ROS credentials. Um, but we are, we have a significant number also using the postal route. Sure. And we'll be, we are already this week, but this week and next week, we're we're putting out a lot of communications through many different channels to encourage people to sign up early, um, so that they realise that leaving it until the 31st of March might not be the best idea. Sure. Um, but but the longest it takes to sign up is a matter of days, and the shortest could be a minute. Yeah. Um, okay. the, yeah. Okay. Unless you encounter some technical problem, where people phone the support desk, and we have to talk them through, you know, issues with their own systems and how they interact. But okay. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the contingency, just uh, just want to tie up a, a slight discrepancy. When the Revenue Scotland paper says we we've, or suggests we've taken a formal decision that we don't need a contingency yeah. and therefore we're, we're not doing it, whereas the Registers of Scotland paper says 
will have a role to play in the event that system contingency has to be invoked. And they also say, um, in the event of the online submission system not being able to be deployed on the 1st of April, we have developed contingency. Now, the registers of Scotland paper is dated the 16th of February, and your one is dated the 27th of February. Is, is the discrepancy That's simply that is. between those two dates exactly the that. decision was taken? Took okay. the decision last week, right. based on the position in the system. Okay, thank you. Um, something, something you mentioned uh, in, when you gave evidence in November, in terms of the IT, you said, I think the final stage was about security. There'd have to be full security testing and full security accreditation. Yep. Um, what, is that still on track? I mean, has it been done or can that not be done till the last minute or where, where are we with that? It's substantially done because it had to be done before we could open our system for sign up okay. on, the, on the 16th of February. So we went through the full security accreditation process, um, looked at the risk profile, accepted it and I, and I had to sign an authority to operate. So we went through all of that before the 16th of February. Um, we will redo it before the 1st of April, but I don't expect it to have materially changed. Sure. Okay. And lastly, then, just, just something you talked about um, near the end of your report, I think your intention is to publish the tax yield uh, monthly uh, on the website. Um, will that will that be sort of, will that be in real time, as it were, or is it being published monthly, but it will be from several months before? Or do you just know how, how up to date will that monthly publication be? So I, I would expect that we would publish figures in May for April, right, for okay. instance. Um, I I don't think I'm yet at the stage where I can give you a date, but sure. No, no. I just we'll I just wanted to know: is, is, is it three months behind, or is it, or is it? But, but you reckon a month? I hope it'll be within the following month yeah, that sure. we would be able to get the data out. I can't see any reason why not. Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Gavin. Uh, Mark. Uh, th thank you, Vina. A couple of questions uh, on the. Um, progress report from SEPA, uh, largely because I didn't want Mr. Kenny to feel left out <laughs> in proceedings, but, but no, I do, do genuinely have a couple of issues that I've, I've, uh, I'd like to raise. I know at point four um, of your update, Revenue Scotland has requested that SEPA hold and manage uh, Scottish landfill tax intelligence on their behalf. SEPA and Revenue Scotland is looking at the operational and security requirements and costs of this. Uh, do you anticipate... When, when do you anticipate sort of arriving at a conclusion in terms of the, the examination of operational and security requirements and costs? Well, th this, this month, certainly, we've got a meeting with the uh, Information Commissioner's Office next week to, to test some of the, the models we've put in place. Obviously, concerns around security and data management and data ownership that we need to run past the, the Commissioner's Office, but we're detailed discussions. We would hope, hope to be in a place to be to be doing that and, and have that arrangements in place this month. I know also at point seven you talk about the recruitment process being underway for compliance officers and specialists. To the recruitment again, is yes, again yeah, last week and yesterday recruitment has, has been undertaken and offer offers made to successful candidates. So okay, so you anticipate that every, uh, every anticipate post will be filled? Anticipate being placed and ready for the 1st of April. Okay. Yeah. Um, at point 11 it says that setup costs were reviewed from 620,000 to 380,000 which is obviously a, a, quite a shift, uh, almost halving the, the, the costs. What, what was it that, that drove that? And that was the change in the IT system where we moved okay. from the understanding that SEPA would be directly receiving tax payments when we when we changed to the IT model and uh, uh, last year we, we reduced our IT costs from 350,000 to 100,000. Okay, and then um, in terms of your responsibilities around the Landfill Communities Fund, um, can I ask, uh, have, have you had discussions with Entrust, who are currently the, the body who administer funds uh, at a UK level, and also has there been input from those bodies who, uh, within Scotland who distribute funds and who receive that, fun that funding from Entrust in terms of the systems you're putting in place? Because obviously... If, if yep. there is no need to reinvent the wheel, then it would, it would seem yep. sensible to, so to take that approach. Very much so. So we, as well as SEPA being in direct contract, contact with Entrust, the Chief Executive of Entrust also sits on the project board that Revenue Scotland run on the programme and, and so do representatives from the, the, the Landfill Communities Fund Forum. So they're all actually having input to the, to the proposals and to the systems and to the guidance that we're, that we're proposing. Okay, and in terms of the timescale for all of that being in place, you anticipate that being in place 1st April in terms of all of the systems and um, so, yeah, well, so, so, that, so that those bodies who, because obviously those bodies who derive funding, uh, it's, it, uh, some of them are very much sort of hand to mouth in terms of the funding coming and, and would want to be assured that landfill communities fund monies will continue to flow 
So they'll be the able to entries. register with, or apply for a, a approval with SEPA from the first of the first of April. Again, we're confident that SEPA will be able to deal with those applications. The reality is that if we don't foresee the money coming in until the end of the first quarter, mm -hmm. when, the, when the first submissions on landfill tax are due. And and the, those bodies who you've been in consultation with are aware of this fact and and comfortable with it. Yes, and we will we will be ready to register them and accept their applications from the first of from the first of April. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mark. That's concluded questions from the committee. Are there any other points that you would wish to make at this time? Mm. We will. No. Thank you very much for answering uh, our questions. And uh, uh, I'm now going to uh, have a two-minute um, suspension while we change witnesses.
been the, the session. Our next item of business is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy on two statutory instruments relating to the Scottish Landfill Tax. The Cabinet Secretary is joined for this item by Colin Miller, David Carucci and John St Clair of the Scottish Government. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement explaining the instruments and remind him not to move the motions at this point. Thank you, Gavir. The Scottish Landfill Tax Standard Rate and Lower Rate Order 2015 specifies the first standard rate and lower rate for Scottish Landfill Tax. These rates will be set to ensure parity with UK Landfill Tax Rates for 2015-16. In setting these rates, I am acting to avoid any potential for waste tourism through material differences between the tax rates north and south of the border. As I outlined to the committee last week, I have designed devolved tax rates to be revenue neutral in aggregate against the block grant adjustment. The Scottish Government forecasts that we will generate revenue of £117 million from Scottish Landfill Tax in 2015-16, net of contributions to the Landfill Communities Fund. This full year forecast has been endorsed as reasonable by the Independent Fiscal Commission. The Scottish Landfill Tax Qualifying Material Order 2015 sets out material that qualifies for tax at the lower rate and the qualifying conditions that have to be met. The lower rate of tax recognises that there is a relatively low level of environmental impact associated with the landfilling of waste which are less active or polluting in the environment. These, materials, these waste materials are inert, they do not biodegrade, they do not produce landfill gas and there is, now a, and there is a low risk of pollution to groundwater or surface water. Landfill sites handling this material can be subject to a much shorter period of aftercare and be returned more readily to other productive uses. Um, the list of qualifying materials convened in the order largely replicates the equivalent UK provisions currently in place. However, it is my intention to engage further with the waste processing industry during the course of the next year to review the position as Scottish landfill tax becomes more established. In particular, consideration will be given to the possibility of bringing forward legislation setting out requirements for loss on ignition testing for trommel fines from 20, April 2016. The aim of this would be to provide greater certainty to the waste industry regarding the tax treatment of residual waste from mechanised screening processes referred to as trommel fines. The proposition is that measuring the proportion of material in this waste that is combustible and therefore active gives a much more reliable and fairer way of determining the tax that is due. Thanks, Convener. Uh, really just one question. Um, you, you said that you're matching the UK landfill tax rates for 15-16. Um, are you 100% certain that the UK rates cannot change? Um, I suppose they could change at the budget in March. Because we have had this problem before that you have uh, given proper notice and all the rest of it after consulting as to what rates would be for other taxes. And we're trying to match, you're obviously trying to match the UK tax rates here, but um, I would be concerned if the UK was to change them between now and then, because that would create all the problems that you're trying to avoid. It, 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 is a, a, it remains a possibility, Convener. I think the likelihood of it is low, given that the UK uh, policy approach that underpins landfill tax will be similar to ours in the sense that it is about essentially creating the incentive to avoid landfill. So therefore, I would be surprised if the UK decided to go to a lower rate, for example, because that would run against the thrust in the direction of the policy position. They could, of course, go to a higher rate, and that would perhaps create the conditions whereby um, there might be an incentive in the north of England to transport waste into Scotland under waste tourism. But um, I think... I think it's. Uh, I think the prob the probability of that is, is very low. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Malcolm to be followed by Gavin. I mean, you you've set it as revenue neutral as against the one year adjustment to the block grant. So I presume that's one hundred and seventeen million, and then you've set the same rates as for the UK. So is the assumption about how much waste there is just notional, as it were, based on? Um, you know, how much will that rate, how much material is required for that rate to reach 117 million, or is there any separate estimate? It just seems a bit of a coincidence that it's all just working out. If there, if there was, a, is there a separate estimate of, of, the, of the amount of waste, or is that just a, a derivative of those other two uh, figures, as it were? The, 
if I just, if Mr. Chisholm gives me one moment, yes, that's correct. The first thing I'd say is that the question of revenue neutrality, I, I have settled that question at the, uh, across all of the devolved taxes that are coming to us. So that's between land and building transaction tax made up of residential and non-residential and also landfill tax. So my point on revenue neutrality is at that level at 494 million as set by the block grant adjustment. Our estimate of how much we think will be raised by landfill tax in Scotland um, is 117 million pounds. The OBR's estimate is 103 million pounds. Now, we've constructed our um, assessment based on the use of the rates that I've set out here, so the same rates as the UK, um, but also taking into account our estimate of what we believe the volume of landfill, landfill tax and the incidence of landfill tax payments that will be made um, by operators. And we come to a different conclusion to the OBR. And you know, that, that's yeah, we've built a, a distinctive Scottish model of how we think that will be created um, based on the information we have from SEPA. Um, the OBR estimate, I assume, is a subset of the um, the wider UK position. Um, so I'm confident in our number, but um, the uh, the whole question of the impact on the budget will be will be felt across the three components of this position between landfill tax, residential, and non-residential transactions. So negotiations on the block grant adjustment. Did the UK government assume 103 million in pound? Uh, but the UK the UK's position overall it would have been that between stamp duty land tax and landfill tax um, they thought we um, we should have been raising or we would raise four, 524 million pounds in total um, and uh, we believed in total we would raise 400 the, the, the existing taxes would raise 461 million pounds so that was the kind of root of the difference between, or source of the difference between the, the two estimates. Um, so, and when we reconciled it, we reconciled it at £494 million. As I explained to Parliament before, because I was not changing my assumptions on landfill tax or non residential transactions, I viewed them as fixed estimates of the, well, because they hadn't been changed by the UK government, I viewed them as fixed estimates within the £494 million and then essentially decided how I was going to raise the £235 million that was required under re, non, uh, under residential um, LBTT to fill the gap. It just seems a bit odd that they think in general that you should raise, uh, that you would raise far much more than your assumptions yet on, on landfill tax. It's the opposite. They think that you'll actually raise uh, less than it just, it's, 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 just a, it's, a, it's a point of difference i think it demonstrates that mm -hmm. you know and i think it rather illustrates that that we are arriving at these estimates by different mechanisms and by different methods it's not as if you know heaven forfend i might be accused of um, suggesting that we in all circumstances raise, raise less in taxation to get a lower block grant adjustment i'm just trying to go through this in as objective and as neutral a fashion as I possibly can do. Yeah, OK, thanks for that, Malcolm. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on your facial expression, uh, um, Cabinet Secretary, but well, I, I, I seem to recall that when we were going through the actual, um, you know, LBTT, etc., um, stage one, um, that uh, all the estimates put forward by the OBR were considered by the Scottish Government to be higher than your estimates, whereas now they seem to be lower because because of the zero waste strategy, you were talking about getting down to 40, 50 million pounds over four or five years, and there was concern expressed by members, Malcolm and myself being two of them, that, that uh, in actual fact the OBR was overestimating the amount of revenue that would be coming in. It's one, of the, area. it's one of the points that I, I made to the committee around uh, the, the, the passage of landfill tax um, during the um, the legislative process that uh, the OBR, if my memory serves me right, and I think I'm correct in this, I think OBR estimates initially started out when this whole process started, probably back in about 2012, that they were estimating a number, I don't think it was far away from 150 million. And in the space of about 18 months, they would have revised that number down by about a third. So they, 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 they you're absolutely correct, convener, that uh, the OBR estimates um, 
did start out significantly higher and I, I was concerned that the estimates were well adrift from where we considered the position to be and you know, we now find ourselves with the OBR estimate at about 103 million. Gavin? Thanks. Just one question on the uh, qualifying material order. Um, the policy note says that the Scottish landfill tax list of qualifying material largely replicates the equivalent UK order. Um, I mean, does, does it mirror exactly the UK order or is it largely replicating, if, as you've suggested? And if it's a latter, are there any significant differences? <coughs> I think the, the principal difference I would highlight is that there will be um, a slightly different approach taken about the, um, the, the testing regime that has to be in place for... Um, assessing whether the, you know, the final waste product, once all you know, processes have been undertaken, is judged to be, um, should be paid at the higher rate or the lower rate. And we've injected some flexibility into that element simply because we don't believe the testing equipment is in, in, uh, available in as comprehensive a uh, basis as it would need to be for us to make that hard and fast as a as a rule. So there's an element of discretion in there. Obviously, the assumption will be, unless it can be proven that the waste should be treated at the lower rate, it would be charged at the higher rate. But before, to be absolutely confident that we had the ability to mandate that point, we would we believe the testing regime would have to be stronger than it is. And I think that's that's something that I would expect to be into in year two. But um, there is, uh, I think that would be the principal difference I would highlight. Um, that's correct. Um, I think <clears throat> it's very hard to legislate and uh, not make it mandatory uh, in, in the first year. Um, so it's to allow industry time to get, um, to procure equipment and uh, put contracts in place for uh, a testing regime in year two. Thanks, Russell. Uh, questions. We now move to uh, agenda item four, the debate on motion S4M12437. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move the motion. Uh, move, Convener. And I put the question on the motion, and the question is that motion S4M12347 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Members are all agreed. Uh, moving on to agenda item five, we move to the debate on motion S4M12438. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to formally move the motion. It moved. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M12348 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Um, now moving on to agenda item six. Our next item of business is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on six statutory instruments relating to the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Act. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement explaining the instruments and remind him not to move the motions at this point. Convener, I'd like to set out some details on the six affirmative SSIs under the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Act 2014. All of these were published in draft last October for consultation and have been revised in the light of responses to that consultation. The postponement of tax pending a review or appeal regulations allow Revenue Scotland to consider applications for the postponement of payment of land and buildings transaction tax pending review or appeal, but only if Revenue Scotland is satisfied that there are exceptional circumstances which justify doing so. There is no such discretion in relation to landfill tax because the landfill operator will already have collected the relevant tax from the person who has made a deposit and must pay the tax due pending an appeal. The Scottish Tax Tribunal's voting and offences regulations provide for majority voting by members of the first tier and upper tribunal and for the chairing member to have the casting vote in the event of a tie. They also create various criminal offences relating to proceedings before a tribunal, such as making a false statement or destroying material that is required to be produced, but, is a defense, but it is a defence if a person can show reasonable cause for acting in the way charged. The interest on unpaid tax regulations provide that interest will be charged by Revenue Scotland on late payments of tax or penalties at 2.5% above base rate and that Revenue Scotland will pay interest on repayments to the taxpayer at base rate. 
The reason for the higher rate in relation to late payments is to provide an incentive for prompt payment of tax which is due, but we have decided to narrow the differential from 3.5 to 2.5% in the light of responses to the consultation. The record-keeping regulations specify exactly what records must be preserved for the purposes of landfill tax and land and buildings transaction tax, respectively. The reimbursement regulations are designed to ensure that a taxpayer who is reimbursed by Revenue Scotland is not unjustly enriched. For example, the regulations require a taxpayer who has been reimbursed by Revenue Scotland to pass on the relevant amount to the person who paid the original amount. This would be expected to apply to landfill operators who have already collected landfill tax from persons who make deposits at landfill sites, and subsequently for some tax, for some reason tax is reimbursed to the operator. Regulations would oblige the operator to repay tax to the person who made the taxable deposit in the first place. And finally, the Proceeds of Crime Disclosure of Information Amendment Order permits the disclosure of information by Revenue Scotland to the Lord Advocate for the purposes of proceedings relating to the confiscation of the proceeds of crime and to the Scottish Ministers in relation to civil recovery of the proceeds of unlawful conduct. I thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. I'd like to invite questions from members. Um, no members have any uh, questions. We'll now move to Agenda Item 7, which is the debate on the motions. If members are content, I propose to put a single question on the motions. Are members content? Members have indicated their contentment. I therefore like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to move the motions on block. It moved on block, Kavina. Thank you. I now put the question on the motions. The question is that motion <coughs> S4M uh, 12464, S4M 12465, S4M 12466, S4M 12467, S4M 12468, and S4M 12469 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. All members uh, are agreed. Um, so I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and I'd like to uh, allow the Cabinet Secretary to leave uh, and we'll just have a one minute suspension where we uh, look to move to item eight. Folks, I'm not going to um, um, have any delay. We'll just go straight on to this, which is the last item of the day, uh, which is to consider five negative instruments as set out on our agenda. I'd like to invite any comments that members may have on those items. Uh, OK, if we have no items and members don't have anything they wish to report on the instruments, uh, the committee will just publish a short report to the Parliament setting out our decision on all the statutory instruments we have considered uh, today. Uh, so thank you very much. That was that's it for today. So thank everyone for your contributions.